This is Josiah Plays Lone Wolf, Book 18, Dawn of the Dragons. You are Lone Wolf, Kai Grandmaster of Summerland. During your long voyage home from a successful quest, you discover that Dark God Nar is poised to unleash a horde of fire-breathing dragons upon the Kai Monastery. Will his agents assassinate you en route? Or will you manage to arrive at your monastery in time to take command of the new order of young Kai warriors in what could be their first and final battle against Nar's Champions of Evil? Hello and welcome! Welcome to another Lone Wolf book. I am excited. We've been playing through these. We've gone through 17 of them so far. Now this is the 18th book. These are further in the books than I ever got when I was reading them as a kid. Uh, so I've never read this one before, although even though the earlier books in the series were some of my favorite books as a kid back in the late 80s. These were written by Joe Deaver, and this was illustrated by Brian Williams. All the music you hear in the background throughout this stream slash video is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. On the YouTube video, you'll see in the description attribution and links to his content will be available for you there and uh yeah i'm excited let's uh, let's get going with another one here we'll be doing it all this entire book in its entirety this entire book in its entirety just in case there wasn't entirely enough entire in that sentence um all in one stream uh, slash all in one video so let's move in here Let's do this. You see the cover of the book off to the right there? That is what the cover of the original American publication looked like. Um, these books were published in the UK first, so the UK cover was different, and any later versions of the book that was published were different. But this this was the original American publication. We've got a quite a spire there. I don't know if that's supposed to be the Kai Monastery. I kind of doubt it, but you never know. And some sort of dragony type creature. All right, so this internet edition of the book was created by Project Aeon of projectaeon.org. All the Lone Wolf books can be found there on their website, readable for free, by permission of the author. The dedication, there's some acknowledgments, we'll move through that. And we come to the story so far. This is essentially the previously on Lone Wolf. And it is probably pretty lengthy, as usual. So, settle in, eat some popcorn, and have a listen to the story so far. You are Grandmaster Lone Wolf of Somerland, sole survivor of a massacre that wiped out the First Order of the Kai, an elite warrior caste. It is the year MS-5077, 27 years since your brave kinsmen perished at the hands of the Dark Lords of Helgadad. These champions of evil, who were sent forth by Nar, the King of the Darkness, to destroy the fertile world of Magnamund, have themselves since been destroyed. You vowed to avenge the murder of the Kai, and you kept your pledge, for it was you who brought about their downfall, when alone you infiltrated their foul domain, the Darklands, and caused the destruction of their leader, and the base of his power that was the infernal city of Helgadad. In the wake of their destruction, chaos befell the Darkland armies who, until then, had been poised to conquer all of Magnamund. Some factions which were part of this huge army most notably the barbaric Dracarum, began to fight with the others for control. This disorder quickly escalated into all-out civil war, which allowed the Freeland armies of Magnamund time in which to recover and launch a counter-offensive. Skillfully, their commanders exploited the chaos and secured a swift and total victory over an enemy far superior in numbers. For seven years now, peace has reigned in Somerland. Under your direction, the once ruined Monastery of the Kai has been thoroughly rebuilt and restored to its former glory, 
and the task of teaching a new order of Kai warriors the skills and proud traditions of your ancestors is also well established. The new generation of Kai recruits, all of whom were born during the era of war against the Dark Lords, possess latent Kai skills and show exceptional promise. These skills will be nurtured and honed to perfection during their time here at the monastery, so that they may teach and inspire future generations, thereby ensuring the continued security of your homeland in future years. Your attainment of the rank of Kai Grand Master brought with it great rewards. Some, such as the restoration of the Kai and the undying gratitude of your fellow Sam Lending, could have been anticipated. Yet, there have been rewards which you could not possibly have foreseen. The discovery that within you lay the potential to develop Kai disciplines beyond those of the Magna Kai, which, until now, were thought to be the ultimate that a Kai Master could aspire to, was truly a revelation. Your discovery has inspired you to set out upon a new and previously unknown path in search of the wisdom and power that no Kai Lord before you has ever possessed. In the name of your creator, the god Kai, and for the greater glory of Summerland and the goddess Ashir, you have vowed to reach the very pinnacle of Kai perfection, to attain all of the Grand Master Disciplines, and become the first Kai Supreme Master. With diligence and determination you set out, you set about the restoration of the Kai Monastery and the training of the New Order recruits. Your efforts were soon rewarded, for, within the space of two short years, the first raw recruits had graduated to become a cadre of gifted Kai masters who, in turn, were able to commence the teaching of their skills to subsequent intakes of Kai novices. Readily, the Kai masters rose to their newfound responsibilities, leaving you free to devote more of your time to the pursuit and perfection of the Grand Master Disciplines. During this period, you also received expert tutelage in the ways of magic from two of your most trusted friends and advisors, Guildmaster Bainden, leader of the Brotherhood of the Crystal Star, and Lord Ramoa, speaker for the High Council of the Elder Magi. In the deepest subterranean level of the monastery, 100 feet below the Tower of the Sun, you ordered the excavation and construction of a special vault. In this magnificent chamber wrought of granite and gold, you place the seven lore stones of Nixator, the gems of Kai power which you had recovered during an earlier quest for Kai knowledge. In this vault, bathed in the golden light of those radiant gems, you spent countless hours in pursuit of perfection, sometimes alone, sometimes in the company of your two able advisors, Bainden and Ramoa. You worked hard to develop your innate Grand Master Disciplines and grasp the fundamental secrets of Brotherhood and Old Kingdom magic. During this time, you noticed many remarkable changes taking place within your body. You became physically and mentally stronger. Your five primary senses sharpened beyond all that you had experienced before. And, perhaps most remarkably, your body began to age at a much slower rate. Now, for every five years that elapse, you age but one year. In the years following your victory over the Dark Lords, peace has reigned victorious and the peoples of the Free Kingdoms rejoice in the knowledge that the evil which once threatened to destroy them has been banished from the face of Magnamund. Readily, men have exchanged their swords for hoes and their shields for plows. And now the only marching they do is along the ruts of their freshly furrowed fields. Few are the watchful eyes that scan the distant horizon in fear of what may appear. Although there are still those who maintain their vigilance, for the agents of the dark god Nar come in many guises, and there are those upon Magnamund who wait quietly in the shadows for the chance to do his evil bidding. Already your newfound skills have been tested against Nar's agents, and you have, on each occasion, acquitted yourself admirably. But your continuing victories against his minions have enraged the Dark God, and inflamed his lust for vengeance. One such minion, the powerful Death Lord of Ixia, 
threatened to enslave the free nations of Magnamund with a weapon forged by Nar himself. Bravely, you ventured alone into the Death Lord's icy domain and confronted him in a life-or-death battle in which you were triumphant. However, as you, were, as you were returning from the Death Lord's frigid realm, you learned that Summerlin had been attacked. In your absence, Nar had sent forth a host of dragon creatures to destroy the new order of the Kai and lay waste to your homeland. The news came as a terrible shock. In Ixia, you had won a great victory over evil, yet at what cost? You had no doubts that the New Order were worthy Kai warriors. But they were all so young, their metal as yet untested in the furnace heat of battle. Secretly, you feared that they would be unable to resist Nar's newest champions, and so you resolved to return as quickly as possible to Somerland to take command of the Kai Monastery and orchestrate your country's defenses. In the court of King Sarnak of Lencia, in the city of Vadera, you received a pledge from the king himself that he would do all in his power to help speed your long journey home to Somerland. Accompanied by Lord Arden, a friend and magician from the land of Desi, you were put aboard a, a Lincian Clipper, one of the fastest of all seagoing vessels. This ship was bound for Garthen, the principal city of Telestria, which lies more than a thousand miles to the east of Vadera. This was to be the first stage of your journey back to Somerland, a destination more than two thousand miles from Lencia. As you set sail from Vadera Harbor, you knew that you were embarking upon a race against time, a desperate race in which the future of your country and the new order of the Kai were at stake. So that is where we find ourselves at the beginning of the book. Hey, Cezo81, good to see you. How are you doing? Uh, no, I cannot start from the beginning again. <laughs> Sorry. I just read, this is just the uh, story so far. So, uh, we haven't actually started the uh, adventure proper here. That's where we find ourselves in the beginning. We're boarding a ship, sailing out of, uh, sailing out of Videra. Rushing home, hopefully, to save the Kai Monastery and our new recruits from being obliterated by an army of dragon creatures of some kind. Game rules have not changed. We get to add a new Grandmaster Discipline since we have completed another book. And I need to decide which one I want to add. I'm thinking... Hmm... I could do Grand Weapon Mastery. That would give me another point of combat skill. I could do... I want to skip Kai Alchemy and Magi Magic because I feel like Lone Wolf just started learning those forms of magic from Bainden and Ramoa, and I think I should take those last. I don't know, it feels more appropriate. The other ones are all advanced versions of the Magna Kai skills he already had, so they seem more natural to take first. So I'll probably take Kai, Kai Surge, actually. When using their psychic ability to attack an enemy, Grandmasters may add 8 points to their combat skill. For every round in which Kai Surge is used, Grandmasters need only deduct 1 Endurance point. When using the weaker psychic attack, Mind Blast, they may add 4 points without loss of Endurance points. Grandmasters cannot use Kai Surge if their Endurance score falls to 6 points or below, so I think I'll take Kai Surge this time. Making me a Grand Thane. And now, every time I add a new discipline, I get to add one point to my base combat skill. So it goes up to 54 total with the Somers word. And two points to my base endurance, making that a solid 56. We have come a long way since book one. A long, long way. In book one, my combat skill was 15, and my endurance was 24 at the start of book one. So, quite a difference our uh, journeys have taken us. Alright, so we'll move forward. 
Equipment. Before you set off on your long journey to Somerland, you take with you a map of Northern Magnamon. Let's take a look at the map. I love the maps. There's a different map in each book. And they're all pretty cool. So here's the new back. I'm going to make the book cover vanish. Just like magic. So we're coming from... Telestria... Garthen. Garthen is where we are sailing to. So this is the this is the destination of our sailing trip. And once we arrive there, we will need to go from Garthen all the way up here to Samarland. And there's the Kai Monastery. There's the war banner of the Kai, pretty cool. The Royal Arms of Samarland. Veretta, Eldenora, Lyris, and Salony. Very neat. Love to see those coats of arms. So we've got quite a long journey overland even after completing the something like thousand mile sea voyage. The Denarg, we've been there. We've been to most of these places now. We've been to a lot of these places. Veretta, Ruinon, we went there in book four. Veretta, we went there in book six. The Denarg, I don't remember which book that was. It was the... but we went there. Magaruith, we went there in the, I think, the first Grandmaster book. Pretty sure we've been to Garthen before, too. Tahu, we went there in... I don't remember which book, but anyway, we've been, we've been to a lot of these places. We've been to Ashnar, of course, we've obviously been to the Kai Monastery and Home Guard. That was in the very first book. First book, the whole journey only took that, only went that far. And then things have gotten more, more uh, advanced since then. So there's the map. We've taken a look at the map. Return to us book cover. Thank you, book cover. Book cover, uh, you know, it listens to me. We also get a pouch of gold. Random number. I got a one, so add 20. We got 21 gold added to our total. Uh, that's five and that's seven. That's 13. That's 46. All right, we're just going to add it to our money at the monastery. We now have 204. We're probably never even going to use this gold ever, but we're stockpiling it nonetheless. We can also take four items from the list below. Quarter staff bow, quiver, six arrows. We're going to refresh our stock of arrows back up to six. That's the most we can carry. And a potion of Lomspur. We definitely want that. Heals for endurance. And we'll take a couple meals. Take a couple meals. Even though we don't need to eat because we have Grand Hunt Mastery, sometimes other people might need food and we could give it to them. All right. Moving on. We should have rules for combat haven't changed. We are now a Grand Thane, rank nine of Grand Mastership. We started as a Grand Defender, I mean after going through all the ranks of Kai and Magna Kai. So we have ranked up one, two, three, four, five times. There's only three ranks to go. Grand Thane. Feeling good. Alright, Improved Discipline. So let's take a look at the lower rank improvements of Kai Surge, since we have that now. Kai Grand Guardians who possess mastery of this disciplines are able to attack up to three enemies in psychic combat simultaneously. Kai Surge. Sun Lords who possess mastery of this discipline are able to launch a Kai Blast, a pulse of intense psychic energy which is capable of affecting both psychically active and inactive enemies. This form of psychic attack is very effective, more so than a usual Kai Surge, Psy Surge, or Mind Blast. It can cause an enemy to lose between 2 and 18 endurance points in one attack. 
A Kai Sun Lord using Kai Blast determines the damage inflicted on an enemy by picking two numbers from the random number table. These numbers should be added together. A zero equals one. And the resultant total equals the damage inflicted. However, use of a Kai Blast will reduce a Sun Lord's endurance points total by four. Cannot be used in conjunction with any other form of psychic attack. So we'll keep that in mind. That could be useful. That could be useful. Anything else on Kai Surge? Here's the, Grand Thane is our current rank, so we're going to read the new abilities for all of the things that we have here. Starting with Deliverance, which is our healing ability. Grand Thanes with this discipline are able to call upon the god Kai for divine assistance should a situation warrant it. Kai cannot intervene to save a Grand Thane from physical danger, but he can give signs which may help a Grand Thane choose the best course of action. A Grand Thane can call upon the god Kai for assistance no more than once every month. The frequency of divine audiences will increase as a Grand Master rises in rank. Good to know. That'll be cool. A sibilance. This is our invisibility ability. Invisibility ability? <laughs> nice. Grand Thanes who possess this skill are able to protect themselves from detection by creatures using infravision, the ability to see the heat radiating from a person or thing, or ultravision, the ability to detect objects or movement in the ultraviolet spectrum of light. So, it can be even more invisible. Kai Surge. Grand Thanes with this skill are able to focus their mind power upon inanimate breakable objects, e.g. bottles, windows, all ceramics, urns, jugs, etc., and cause them to explode violently. Any person or creature in close proximity to such an explosion risks injury from flying shrapnel. That's pretty cool. We can make objects explode with our mind now. Grand Nexus. That is the enhancement of our telekinesis, which also protects us from like heat and stuff, heat and cold. Grand Thanes who possess mastery of this discipline can pass th freely through shadow gates. We could already do that, I thought. These phenomena are special portals which enable one to access other dimensions and planes of existence outside of Magnamund. Kai Grand Thanes are able to detect the location of shadow gates and pass through them without suffering any physical ill effects. Oh, that's cool. The range of detection increases as a Kai Grand Master rises in rank. Telenosis is an improved version of our sixth sense. Grand Thanes who possess this discipline are able to detect the exact location of precious gems and valuable metals such as gold, platinum, and silver. These minerals and metals may occur naturally in the ground, or they could be part of a hidden treasure hoard. The range of this ability is limited at first, but increases steadily as a Kai Grandmaster rises in rank. That's pretty great. All right, and we don't have magic on magic, so our abilities have improved as usual. Moving forward, the Grandmaster's Wisdom says the same thing as every book. And we reach section one, the actual beginning of the book. Here we go. Are you ready to begin our adventure? Are you ready? Are you ready? Because it begins soon. Okay, here we go. You set sail from Vadera Harbor on a bitterly cold, gray, late winter's day. The masts of your host ship, the Lencian Clipper Saxon, have been rigged with every available square inch of canvas to catch the prevailing winds that will, with luck, propel you quickly to Telestria, the first stage of your long journey home. The Clipper is a sleek and impressive craft, and its departure does not go unnoticed. Yet all, yet of all the many Lencians who have turned out to watch and wave it farewell, only King Sarnak and his closest advisors know the true purpose of its voyage. Let me just say, we have had really bad luck with sea voyages. Every time we're on a ship, almost every time, bad, bad things happen. So I'm expecting this ship to go down in some way for everybody on it to be killed because that's generally what happens. Once the Saxon is beyond the sheltering walls of Vadera Harbor, 
Its captain charts an easterly course along the Tentarius, the chain of seas and landlocked lakes which separate the two continents of Magnamund. You and your companion, Lord Arden, settle into the ship's easy routine, and, with few onboard duties to perform, you endeavor to pass the long hours constructively. With the aid of a map which he gives to you, Arden briefs you on the route you should travel if you are to reach Summerland as swiftly as possible. You spend your time discussing the details of the route and pondering the new evil which now threatens your homeland and the Kai. And there's our ship, has a lot of sails. Every night, as you lie awake on your bunk staring at the tarred beams of your cabin, you wish away the miles that separate you from your beloved homeland. You want, most of all, to be with your young Kai acolytes in this dark hour, but fate has seen fit to place a great distance between you. Fearful of what you may find if you arrive home too late, every night you offer up prayers to the gods Ishir and Kai to help speed your return to Summerland. And I wonder if they answer our prayers, or if they just turn a blind eye and laugh cruelly. Ten days after leaving Videra, the Saxon drops anchor in Varnos Harbor in Garthen, the crown capital of Telestria. The sleek and elegant lines of the Lencian craft contrast starkly with the drab, functional hulls of the merchant ships and dows which crowd this city port's jetties and wharves. Lencian craft are a rare sight in Garthen, and the Saxon is the rarest of Lencian craft. It is no wonder that its arrival stirs a frenzy of interest and speculation among the citizens of this capital. Word of your arrival travels quickly to the Royal Citadel, and a troop of Queen Yvain's court cavalry are dispatched to the harbor. They are led by a stern-faced man who wears the uniform and gold insignia of the Lord Constable, the highest military rank in the Telestrian army. He brings his column of regal horsemen to a halt at the quayside. Then he dismounts and strides forward to welcome you in person as you disembark from the ship. I think we've met this guy before. We have definitely visited Garthen and Torgar in a previous adventure. The smooth, dark hair and noble countenance of the Lord Constable are oddly familiar, reminding you of someone whose name momentarily you cannot recall. Welcome, my lord! He says with a respectful salute. I am Nathor, Lord Constable of the Royal Citadel. My troop would be honored to escort you to an audience with Queen Yvain. Pray tell me, Lord Constable, you reply. Have we not met before? No, sire. I venture you must be thinking of my late brother, Adamas. He held the office of Lord Constable afore me. I understand that you and he once fought together in the war against the Dark Lords. He spoke most highly of your courage. Sadly, though, he is no longer with us. He died valiantly during the great siege of Torgar. Oh, Adamas died. That's a shame. Okay. This is his brother. That's why he kind of looks familiar. You accept Lord Constable Nathor's offer of an escort to Queen Yvain's Citadel and call to Lord Arden, who has been watching from the deck of the Saxon, to come and join you. As Arden disembarks, Nathor gives a signal to his men who are busy keeping an inquisitive crowd of citizens at bay. Hurriedly, they clear a gap in the pressing wall of curious, wide-eyed Garthenians, and moments later the horse-drawn coach comes trundling through towards the quay. Once you and Arden are safely aboard, Lord Constable Nathor shouts a terse command to the driver, and the coach speeds away from the harbor, escorted by the troop of court cavalry. A swervingly swift journey through Garthen's steeply narrow streets ends when the coachman reins in his horses in the courtyard of the Royal Citadel. Everywhere you look, you see soldiers of the royal household in uniforms bedecked with glittering braid. A fanfare of trumpets announces your arrival, and with minimal delay, Nathor escorts you personally to the State Hall, where Queen Yvain of Telestria, seated upon a throne and surrounded by a dozen of her court advisors, is waiting patiently for you to appear. 
Welcome, Grandmaster, she says graciously. We have been expecting you. King Sarnak sent word of your arrival by Message Hawk, and we have made arrangements to help speed your passage homewards. Respectfully, you bow to the Queen and voice your thanks for the cooperation she has seen fit to offer you. Hey, Nox Moo, how you going? Good to see ya. Moo to you, too. The next thing Nox Moo types is, oh, hi. Not at all, Grandmaster, for Telestria is in your debt. Were it not for you, our land would be in the thrall of the Dark Lords. With this, Queen of Vane dismisses her advisors and motions for you, Arden, and Lord Constable Nathor to approach to the foot of her throne. I understand the urgency of your journey, Grandmaster. She says, her voice hushed as if she fears being overheard. But I must caution you to be on guard. The Dark Lord, the Dark God Nars agents are abroad with plans to thwart your homecoming. I have received word from my garrisons in the north that Zlan Beast and Kron riders have been sighted in the night skies. They venture forth from the ruins of the Dark Lord cities of Nadgazad and Cragmantle sent by the express command of Nar himself. They know now that you triumphed in Ixia, and they are watching expectantly for your coming. I thank you for this information, your majesty, but I am sure that I can avoid these night riders, you reply confidently. I have no doubt of this, Grandmaster, she says, but they are not the only agents in Nar's employ. Word of your coming has spread like wildfire through out the shadowy underworld of thieves and assassins. Great rewards of gold and dark magic have been offered for your death. With respect, your majesty, you reply, tactfully masking your skepticism. How do you know this to be true? Grandmaster, it is true. I have heard it from the very lips of an assassin who was plotting your murder, here in the heart of my capital. He was captured while attempting to recruit others, and he is being held prisoner in the dungeons of this citadel. Perhaps you would welcome the chance to question this man yourself? Uh, I think I will definitely accept Queen of Vane's offer and question the would-be assassin. We got some questions for him. We're gonna find out what he knows. Jack Bauer style. No, maybe not quite that bad. I am hella psychic, Noxmu. Hella. Queen of Ain commands the Lord Constable to take you to the Citadel Dungeons, which are located several levels below the State Hall. Here, shackled to the dank stone wall of a rat-infested cell, is the man who was caught in a Garthen Tavern plotting your murder. Limp and unconscious, he hangs by his wrists in chains, his emaciated body showing all too clearly the signs of recent tortures. A pot-bellied gaoler scoops a bucket of foul water from a trough by the cell door and revives the prisoner by pouring it unceremoniously over his head. Coughing and spluttering, the wretch stirs to consciousness. He raises his face and you sense that he recognizes immediately who you are. His eyes blaze with an undisguised hatred. Nox says, if you'd prefer not to question the prisoner, reminds me of the option of if you'd prefer not to ask the soldier by Captain Progoff. And yeah, it's like, who, who wouldn't question the prisoner? Right? Like... If you would like to know more, if you don't want to know more, go to... If you'd like to return to the outpost. He's a toughen, growls the gailer. I've used all my skills on him, but he won't say who his paymaster be. The fat gailer reaches for a pair of long-handled pinchers, which are protruding from a brazier or a brazier of hot coals. Why do I always pronounce that word wrong? Brazier, totally different thing. Hot coals. Ah, I got coals in my brazier. I'm burning. Perhaps you'll be wanting to interrogate him yourself, sire, he says, offering you the pinchers. Wisps of smoke curl from their sharpened tips, which are red and glowing. 
Hi, Kaler. There are questions I'd like this man to answer, but I'll not be needing those. You reply, declining the use of the cruel pinchers. I prefer to rely on my own methods of interrogation. Kai Alchemy? Don't have it. I do have Kai Surge. I just got it. First thing, I get to use my new Kai Surge. Yes. Let's Kai Surge this fool. You focus your psychic powers and launch a pulse of energy at your prisoner's mind in an attempt to weaken his resolve. Reduce your endurance score by one point. Ow. Give myself a headache. You sense that his memory is protected by a magical shield, but it proves to be ineffective against your psychic probe. The man shrieks with fear as his body is racked by uncontrollable tremors. You command the prisoner to reveal the identity of the person who sent him here to Garthen to murder you, and a mass of images begin to swirl and solidify in your mind's eye. They are the images of a past meeting in a far-off place which you recognize to be Duodon, the capital city of Eldenora. You see a shadowy figure, sheathed in ornate chainmail, handing a bulging pouch of gold to the prisoner in a dimly lit alleyway. The figure speaks your name before melting away into the shadows. Who is this person? You say, commanding the trembling prisoner to answer. He parts his bruised lips and tries to utter a name, but no sound emerges. You sense that he is fighting to overcome the remnants of the shielding spell placed upon his mind. Moving closer, you try to make out the name he is struggling hard to whisper. Will he manage to whisper the name? Mini cliffhanger, we don't know. We just don't know. Are you ready to find out? Okay, let's find out. Also, I heal up, because I'm a healer. In before Kadok, didn't we kill Kadok? Kadok is actually dead, like finally dead. We beat him like three times, and the third time, we actually killed him. We disintegrated him into like dust or something, as I recall. Fucking Kadok. I was fucking sick of that guy. Cautiously, you place your ear close to the trembling man's mouth and try to identify the name he is struggling hard to utter. L L Luther! He breathes. Then he gives a chilling snigger and you feel the hairs on the nape of your neck begin to rise. Your sixth sense is screaming a warning. You are in danger. With his tongue, the prisoner dislodges a hollow tooth and bites down hard upon it. It releases a vile greenish gas, which he ex exhales directly into your face. Whoa, he exhales some gas, but I have Grand Nexus, so I give no fucks about this gas. Noxmi says, that was my brother, Madak. <laughs> oh, shit. He's got seven brothers. All of them have names that end with Adak. They just keep coming and coming. Alright, Grand Nexus, let's do this. You recoil from the insidious green cloud and fall back towards the cell door. Your mastery of Nexus protects you from this highly poisonous gas, but the Gaylor and Lord Nathor are not so fortunate. Both are vulnerable to its deadly effect. Choking and retching, they collapse to the floor, their fingers scrabbling at their swelling throats as they fight desperately for breath. You grab hold of their tunics, one in each hand, and drag their bodies out of the cell into the cleaner air of the corridor beyond. The super clean air of this dungeon. Here you use your Magna Chi discipline of curing to ease the effects of the poison gas. Your skill and the swiftness of your actions save them from a painful, suffocating death. Wha what happened? Wheezes Nathor as he slowly recovers from the deadly gas. You peer into the cell and the man at the man now hanging limply in chains, and then you turn to Nathor and say, Suicide. A suicide and an attempted murder.
The prisoner has just killed himself with a poison pellet, and it seems his last wish was to take all three of us with him. Well, he didn't get his last wish, did he? When you sense that the poison gas has dissipated, and the air is no longer perilous to breathe, you enter the cell and take one last look at the prisoner's body. The man's face and upper body have been horribly disfigured by the effects of the gas, yet the extensive blistering has only partially destroyed a small tattoo on the side of his neck. It is a six-pointed star, which you recognize to be the national symbol of Eldenora. He must have died within seconds of biting into the poison pellet, says Nathor. It chills me to think that whoever sent him here commanded such respect from this man that he chose to die in this way, rather than face the consequences of failing his mission. Yeah, I'd rather die from his own poison gas than die from whatever method of execution we were going to use on him after torturing him some more. Amazing. The, what zealotry. Aye, and if there are others like him who are out to stop me you reply uneasily, then my journey home to Summerlin may prove more difficult than I expected. Well, yeah, you know it's going to be difficult. You know there's going to be a ton of people trying to stop you. I mean, cut the games. This is not a surprise. You leave the cell and return to the State Hall, where Lord Constable Nathor reports what has happened to the Queen. Concerned for your safety, she suggests that you spend the night at the Royal Citadel as her guest. Well, if she insists, I suppose I could stay at the palace. You accept her gracious invitation and enjoy a fine feast and the hospitality of her court. Then, shortly after dawn of the following day, you bid Her Majesty and your companion, Lord Arden, a fond farewell before beginning the next stage of your long journey home. Mindful of the dangers, the queen gives her lord constable a royal seal and places him, along with a troop of ten court cavalrymen, at your disposal. Ah, oh, these people are dead. These people are fucking so dead. People that have gone with us as guides or escorts have almost always met with terrible fates. With the exception of Prague. Prague hung in there. Lord Nathor and his men are to act as your guides and bodyguards on the road to Vanamore, the capital city of neighboring Palmyrian. This republic is closely allied to Telestria and lies along its eastern border. Palmyrian also has close ties with your homeland, and you look forward to the chance of renewing your friendship with its leader, Elector Manatine. I don't remember Elector Manatine. Mounted on fine Telestrian steeds, your party leaves the walled city of Garthen by its east gate. Here you cross a great stone bridge, on the far side of which is a signpost pointing to the east. It reads, Vanamore, 280 miles. Max said Prague has the skill of redshirt avoidance, totally. 280 miles is a, is a long journey just to get to the next place. Let's, uh, let's see where we're at here on the old map. Map check. Checking the map. Checking the map. Alright, we're in Garthen. Okay? We're down here, Garthen. We're riding to Vanamore. That right there is 280 miles. And we need to get all the way up to here. So, we have a ridiculous journey. This is going to take forever. Man, all of our new initiates and recruits are going to be so dead. They're going to be dead and cold and eaten by animals by the time we get there. Cut the games. We can't get there in time to help them. This is a ludicrous... This is 280 miles right here. And we're going all the way up there. Across all these lands. Yeah. Our recruits are boned. That's all there is to it. The new order of the guy is dead. The road which crosses the plains to the east of the river is deeply rutted. Fortunately, though, it is dry, there having been little rain in these parts for weeks. No shit, Noxmoo. If you'd like to call Bandit and his skyship, turn to page 354. Reels. I remember they said in the last book, though, they specifically said that Bandit had taken his skyship 
down to Southern Magnamon somewhere really far away and he wouldn't be back for months and months. They specifically said that. So, Bandon is unfortunately not an option. Progress is good, and by midday, you and your troop have covered more than 30 miles. You pass many wagons on this road, mostly driven by farmers who are taking their crops to the markets and wharves of Garthen. These wagon drivers seem an unusually loyal and friendly breed. Invariably, they wave and cheer the moment they recognize the uniforms of Queen Yvain's court cavalry. After a brief rest at a village on the road, you continue your ride across the open plains and descend into a wide valley where a shallow stream winds its way through a mass of reed beds and willow copses. Beyond this valley, the land becomes increasingly hilly. The sun is almost touching the horizon when you come to a small wayside shrine dedicated to the goddess Ishir. Here, a track leads off to the north, and, a mile distant, you can make out the walls and tall bell tower of a chateau high in the hills. That's the monastery of the Vatterish Brethren, says Nathor. They're a holy order devoted to the worship of the goddess Ashir. We'll find safe shelter with them this night. The sun is set, and dusk is quickly turning to darkness by the time the troop reaches the gates of the Vatterish Monastery. The brothers of this holy order are led by an elderly monk called Rasbarin, whom Nathor has met once before. The old cleric welcomes him warmly, as if he was his son, and then he invites you to stay here overnight. I don't know, the last time I met some monks in a monastery, it went really badly. They poisoned me, I almost died from the poison, and then I had to fight this tough-ass dude in there who almost killed me. And that was a long time ago. I don't even remember what book that was in. That was in, like, book five or six. Or four. Somewhere between four and seven. It was in one of the early books. Monks did me dirty. They did me dirty. But I think we'll trust these monks, because Nathor vouches for them. He says they're cool. The monk's evening meal is simple fare, but well prepared, and wholesome nonetheless. Store any endurance points you may have lost during your adventure so far. Well, I haven't lost any. Afterwards, Rasbaran invites you and Nathor to his chambers to sample some of the monk's specialty. A fine liqueur called Aquas. When you are raising a glass of this golden liquid to your lips, when suddenly the peace is shattered by a loud, cawing shriek which echoes through the surrounding hills. Uh-oh. Drama. So much drama in the LBC, it's kind of hard being Snoop D.O. Double G. I do have Telenosis, and I'm going to use it. In the name of the gods, splutters Nathor, spilling liqueur down the front of his tunic. What was that? A knot of fear tightens in the pit of your stomach. A cron, you reply, recognizing at once the fell cry of this unwelcome creature. You hurry to a window and see the large bat-like cron silhouetted against the moon. A man-sized rider clings precariously to the creature's reptilian back as it swoops and soars among the hills and gullies. You must come away from the window, my lord replies an anxious Nathor, uh, lest it detect your presence here. You take heed of the Lord Constable's advice and retreat from the window. Furthermore, you use your Magnakai skill of Psy Screen to shield your mind in case the Kron Rider is able to employ psychic abilities to locate your presence. It's not the first time it's come, says Rasbaran. Every night for the past ten days we've heard it circling the hills. Sometimes there's more than one of its kind. He suggests that you bunk in the cellar of the monastery, where you may be safer from detection, and you accept his offer gladly. For hours, the sound of the Kron's incessant cry echoes among the surrounding hills, making it difficult for you to sleep at all this night. As you lie awake, listening to its ghastly caw, a sense of foreboding invades your mind, and, despite your strong will, you feel powerless to overcome it. Restless and agitated, 
You get up and pace around the cellar until, at last, the cawing ceases and a chorus of birdsong ushers in the dawn. Lose three endurance because of lack of rest. Alright. I am lay tired. There's a cron silhouetted against the moon. Cawing. You join the troop for breakfast with Rasbarin and his brothers. During this meal, the elderly monk offers you a flask of aquas to fortify you on the road ahead, and a talisman of a shear to ward off hostile creatures. These are both backpack items. After breakfast, Nathor thanks Rasbarin for his hospitality and makes a donation of 50 loon to his monastery. If, before leaving, you too would like to make a donation, erase from your action chart the number of gold crowns you decide to give to the Holy Vatterish Brethren. I'll make a donation, why not? I've got some loon. But, um... He donated 50 loon? That's a lot. That's like over 12, gr over 12 crowns. Nox says, if you do not drink coffee during the breakfast, lose an additional three endurance points. Well, I am going to outdo him in his generosity. He donated what is the equivalent of a little over 12 crowns. I'm going to donate 13 crowns and beat him and go down to 20. Ha, Nathor. You have failed at generosity quest. I beat you. Meanwhile, I get to have 10 items, so I can take a flask of aquas. And I can take a talisman of Ashir. And now my backpack is full. So let me just boop, 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 boop. That's better. All right. Let's move on. Start healing up. Overhead, the sun gleams like a jewel in the clear blue sky, and the early morning air bites with a refreshing sharpness which helps to revive your spirits. A layer of thick frost covers the stony trail from the monastery, and it scrunches loudly under the horse's hooves as you make your careful descent. Soon you rejoin the east road and follow it, through a series of shallow gorges, to a thick pine forest where the ground is covered with mossy rocks. Here the road ascends to a crest where a pall of black smoke stains the cloudless sky. As you approach the crest, you suddenly sense danger ahead and shout a warning to Nathor. He commands the troop to halt while you go ahead to assess the situation. Beyond the crest you see a broad valley with steeply wooded sides. At its center, there is a village and a large stone building which, when you magnify your vision, you determine to be a church. The roof of this building is ablaze and several bodies lie dotted around its cultivated grounds and gardens. You signal to Nathor to join you and, when he arrives upon the crest, he is able to identify the burning church. That's Pine Peaks Abbey, he says, his voice stilted with anxiety. They're in trouble. We must help them. He calls his men to come forward, and, before you can caution him, he leads them at the gallop down the steep trail which descends towards the valley floor. Cursing his impetuosity, you spur your steed onward and follow in his wake. You have covered less than half a mile when suddenly your magnakai sense of divination screams a warning. The troop is riding directly into an ambush. <laughs> I told you my, my escort guys were fucked. These guys are about to die. They just rode crazily into an ambush. They're all wearing red shirts under their armor. Desperately, you shout for Nathor to halt, but your command goes unheeded. 
Then, from out of the surrounding pines, there comes a volley of arrows and spears. One spear penetrates deep into your horse's flank, killing him instantly. Wow, insta-killed my horse. That's rude. Random number, look at this. This right here is instant death. That's an instant death number. Let's not get that. I got a two! That's not going to be a good number either. <laughs> Lone Wolf's Impetuosity Curse. I hate these stupid escort quests. <laughs> Yeah. Alright. Could have gone worse, could have gone better. Your slain horse crashes to the ground and you are thrown through the air. You land among the boulders and bracken which border the hill road, but your swift Kai reflexes prevent you from sustaining serious injury. Lose two endurance points. Bruised but unshaken, you spring to your feet in time to see a yelling horde of leather-clad men, each brandishing a sword or a spear, come rushing from hiding places among the surrounding trees. As they close in upon you, you draw your weapon and prepare to fight for your life. Oh, these guys are about to get skizzled. Alright. Well, I'm more than 11 points up on them on combat skills, so I'm not going to bother with any mental attacks. I'm just going to wreck them. Could get a one-shot here. Are we ready? 52 versus 42. Round one. I lost one. He lost 16. 51 versus 26. Boom! Dead. I lost one endurance in that fight. Eldenoran ambushers just got racked. Okay, so they weren't prepared. They didn't understand that they were ambushing a Kai Grandmaster, obviously. Somebody... They should have asked somebody. Alright, let me uh, start healing up here. As the last of your attackers collapses at your feet, you turn and run headlong down the steep hill track. Arrows and spears whistle past on all sides as you endeavor to outrun the remaining ambushers. By dint of luck and speed, Nathor and his troop of court cavalry have survived the Eldenorn ambush with little injury and no loss of life. Okay, I'm surprised by that. I'm very surprised. They've only survived here just to just to lull you into a false sense of security. They're trying to trick you. They're the George R R Martin slash Joe Dever slow Joe Dever is still gonna kill these people off. They're still gonna die. Don't be fooled. They're not safe. You see them in the distance, gathered in a group on the valley floor, and you wave to them to show that you are still alive. Immediately, Nathor gallops away from the troop and comes speeding up the track to your rescue. As he gets nearer, he slows his horse to allow you to leap astride its rump. Once aboard, he pulls his steed about and descends once more towards the valley floor, cheered on by his anxious men. Follow me! commands the Lord Constable as he gallops past his troop without slowing. You glance over your shoulder and see them spur their steeds forward, their faces set in expressions of grim determination. Upon entering the village, you note a number of frightened women and children who are huddled beside stone walls or lying beneath hay carts. Some are cradling the bodies of their dead menfolk, who lie scattered in the fields nearby. Then you catch sight of a group of Eldenorans in the grounds of the abbey. All are laden with loot, yet even so there are some who are squabbling amongst themselves in an effort to grab an even bigger share of the booty. Nathor brings his steed to a halt, and you both quickly dismount. As your feet touch the ground, you notice a drunken Eldenoran come lurching out of the doorway of a nearby cottage. He has a flagon of ale in one hand, and a young woman with a crying baby in the other. He sees you, and in a moment of drunken panic, he drops the flagon and unsheathes a dagger from his belt. It is clear from his actions that he intends to stab the screaming child. What? Why would he stab the... No, motherfucker. This guy's going down. There's no child stabbing on my watch. <laughs> I like how you have an option to just do nothing. If you don't want to use any of that shit, turn to 55 and watch the baby get stabbed. Nathor used up his own talisman of Ashir's power to give his troop invincibility in that fight. He was like, that was 50 loon well spent. Ha ha ha! <laughs> yeah, sounds legit. All right, I'm gonna use my bow. Oh, I could Kai surge him instead because I have a new. I have Kai surge now. 
I gotta use Kai Surge because I just got it, so it's like my new it's like my new toy. I gotta use it whenever I can. Let's Kai Surge this dude. No baby stabbing, son. Using your discipline, you launch a concentrated burst of psychic energy at the drunken thug. The bolt penetrates his mind and stuns him, causing him to freeze like a stone statue. Reduce your endurance points by one, but I get to heal one for this section, so those cancel each other out so it stays the same. Unfortunately, this temporary paralysis also prevents the young woman and her child from breaking free from his grasp. After a few moments, the thug emerges from his state of psychic shock in a murderous mood, and you are forced to draw your weapon and rush towards him in an effort to stop him before he can enact his revenge on his innocent captive's child. Well, yeah, I assumed that as soon as I mind-blasted him and stunned him, I would have run up there and cut his fucking head off. Moments before you reach him, he throws the young woman and her child to the ground and spins around to face you. His dagger held poised to slash at your throat. He strikes, and you dodge his first clumsy blow with ease. As he is about to strike out for a second time, you raise your weapon and aim a scything blow at his head. Yeah, I'm really unconcerned by this guy. A combat skill 30 guy? I mean, come on. And a single drunk Eldenoran thug? This guy is nothing to me. He is like unto nothing. 52 and 30. He took a, po he took a point off me. And now he's dead in the second round. He nicks me with the dagger. I lop off his head. Lop is a great word. Start healing up immediately. Thank you! Thank you! Cries the young woman, whose child you have just saved from certain death at the hands of the drunken thug. Sobbing with gratitude, she collapses at your feet. Gently, you lift her by the arm and assure her with kind words that her ordeal is over. She smiles, reassured, but her expression quickly changes when she spots something moving behind you. There he is! That cur, Holkar! She spits. He's the murdering leader of these bandits! This chaos is his doing! So here we have a picture of there's the church in the background. Some gravestones. The looters coming out with a bag of loot. Here's the woman. She's been crying. She looks sad. She looks pissed off. She's got a very unhappy looking baby going on there. So, that's the situation. You turn to look at the object of her hatred and see a swarthy brigand dodging between the gravestones that line the abbey grounds. He has a sack full of loot slung over his shoulder and he is hurrying towards his horse which stands close by the abbey's perimeter wall. Determined not to let him escape, you rush across the road and into the grounds of the abbey to give chase. And by his horse, you mean my new horse. Because I need a horse, and this guy's about to die, and then I'll take his horse. That'll be convenient. The brigand leader mounts his horse, but before he can make good his escape, you take a running leap over the abbey wall and drag him out of the saddle. Together, you crash to the frost-hardened ground, and desperately he kicks and struggles to break free from your steely grip. Out of his boot, he snatches a stiletto blade and thrusts it viciously at your throat. You dodge your head aside, avoiding its razor-sharp tip, but in doing so, you let the brigand slip out of your hands. I just want to say that as I was reading this, when I said you dodge your head aside, I actually dodged my head aside. <laughs> and I, I was, that was probably unnecessary. Just so you know, if you were watching me, you would be able to see what dodging your head aside looks like, but you're not watching me. But trust me, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> he rolls away. I actually just rolled away. No, I didn't just roll away. I'm just kidding. He rolls away and begins to rise to his feet, but then he freezes, his eyes wide with fearful recognition as he stares at your face. L Lone wolf? He gasps, mortified as if he is confronting a ghost. Drop the dagger and surrender, you order, leveling your weapon at his head to reinforce your command. Swiftly, the brigand's expression changes from one of shock to one of sneering defiance. You'll never take me alive, he spits, and to your shocked surprise, he thrusts his dagger deep into his chest. Man, there's a lot of suicide going on in this book. If you possess the Grandmaster Discipline of Deliverance, 
and have attained the Kai rank of Sun Knight or higher. I do, and I have, so I guess I can heal him up here. I can heal this guy. His mortal injury. A little healing on myself as well. You rush to the brigand's side and wrench the dagger from his chest. The wound is deep, and you sense that it has penetrated his heart. He has only seconds to live. Calling upon your advanced healing skills, you cause the torn tissues of his heart wall to knit together sufficiently enough to stem the bleeding. Nox says, if I kill myself first, it'll be sure to lower your morale. Yeah, not so much. I won't even let this guy kill himself. Not only can I kick your ass in combat, I can stop you from killing yourself. How do you like that? How do you know my name? You demand. Who sent you here? What is your purpose? The brigand tries to smile through his pain, and a trickle of crimson blood runs from the corner of his mouth. You... You're the reason I'm here! He whispers. I came here looking to finish you. I'm finished now. Luther would not be pleased. Fucking Luther. Then a fit of coughing reopens his punctured heart. With a final gurgling gasp, he expires in your arms. Oh, he was past his expiration date. I'm like smelling him to see his, Do you think- I'm like asking- Lady, come over! Smell this guy! Is he bad? Do you think he's gone bad? Or is he still good to eat? I think he might be expired. You get to your feet and look around at the devastation he and his men have brought to the sleepy village of Pine Peaks. Leaderless, the remaining brigands abandon their loot and flee to the wooded hills to rejoin their confederates. Those who attempted to ambush the troop when first you entered this valley. Nathor's men have secured the village and they are helping the villagers to fight the fires which are burning in several of the cottages. Noxmu says that could be Lone Wolf's version of torturing. Inflict mortal wound in combat, use deliverance, rinse and repeat. Never mind the hot coals. Yeah, there you go. I'll keep healing you and hurting you over and 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 over. Alright, let's go. Keep healing. 55. You help Nathor and the villagers to fight the fires which threaten to consume their humble homes, using your Magnakai skill of Nexus to good effect. And when you have saved all you can, you summon the troop together to assess the situation. Six brigands and two court cavalry troopers were killed during the brief fight to secure the village. See, there's two down. They already took two of them. Those won't be the last two to die. The villagers themselves have lost eight of their menfolk, with several others wounded and some missing. These are presumed to be hiding in the woods. They have retained most of their possessions, but their abbey has been gutted by the fire which Holkar and his thugs started. Nathor conducts a burial for the slain villagers and his two men, during which he pledges that Queen Evane will be informed of what happened here this day. Yeah, I can see Queen Evane giving a shit about this. Not so much. Her Majesty, Her Majesty will see that justice is done, he assures the tearful gathering of peasants. The bandit realm of Eldenora will be made to pay for this crime. Yeah. Sure they will. After the burial, Lord Nathor gives to the village elders a weighty purse of silver loon. How much loon does this fucker have? He's just passing out loon left and right. And a horse which belonged to one of his slain men. It is a small token for the loss they have suffered, but one that is appreciated by the villagers. The other horse is given to you to replace the steed that was killed beneath you during the ambush on the road. He just beat me in Generosity Quest. Fucking guy with all his loon. And I healed to full. It is the mid-afternoon when the troop resumes the long journey east to Vanamore. During the ride, Lord Nathor voices his grave concern that Eldenor and bandits should be operating in the heart of his country. They have rarely dared to venture this far from home before. 
Although he does not say so, you sense that he knows the reason why they have become so bold of late. They have been sent here to find and kill you. The road climbs out of the valley and zigzags its way through the forested hills to a high pass. Beyond this pass, there stretches a wide expanse of lush grassland where herds of wild deer roam and graze freely. It is late in the afternoon when you catch sight of a procession approaching on the road ahead. Mostly, they are men dressed in ragged brown robes, and one is carrying aloft a grimy banner which bears the image of a lightning bolt set upon a full moon. Oh, really? So, more crazy monks. Counterfeit detection. <laughs> Shoney pilgrims, says Nathor dismissively. They're wandering beggar monks who have taken a vow of poverty. Many in Garthen regard them as just a gang of scroungers who pretend to be a holy order so they can fleece the foolish. I suggest we ignore them and press on. Let's take a look at these Shoney pilgrims. Guys burning some incense there, swinging it back and forth. Deeply rutted road. Why are there so many different ruts? Like... I guess people aren't, don't all drive their wagon the same place, or they're not all the same size. There's their banner. That guy doesn't get a hood. No, I'm gonna stop and talk to him. Is it a bad idea? Probably. Am I gonna do it anyway? Yeah. Your decision to stop and speak with the pilgrims clearly irritates the Lord Constable, but he bows to your authority and waits patiently for you to finish talking with them. You learn that this ragged group are on their way to Garthen. Their leader, a bearded wretch called Pospora, also tells you of a strange camp that he and his pilgrims discovered last night near a place on the road which he calls Red Rock. However, this information does not come cheaply. You are pressed by the pilgrims into making a donation to their dubious cause. Deduct five gold crowns from your action chart. Having satisfied your curiosity, you return to the troop and continue the ride east. That's fine. For an hour, you ride across the rich grasslands of eastern Telestria until you come to a range of hills that are carpeted with scented spruce and pine. The road snakes its way through this ruggedly beautiful landscape to a place where a smaller track branches off the main trail heading south. A huge boulder of red granite marks the start of this adjoining track, yet there is no signpost to indicate where it leads. Using your Kai tracking skills, you determine that the track has been used by men and horses during the last 24 hours. And the monk just told us there was some kind of strange camp down this way. Nox, this book seems very money oriented. Yeah, it's interesting because it seems to come in like spurts. Like you'll go one or two or three books in a row where not a single coin changes hands whatsoever. And then you'll hit a book where all, all of a sudden there's all these ways to spend money and lose money and gain money and stuff. It's like money comes into play about once every three or four books, I think. Of course I'm going to investigate the track. The word investigate is there. I always investigate things. You follow the narrow track for half a mile before arriving at a clearing. Here, you discover the poorly concealed remains of an encampment, which, on closer examination, you are convinced was used by the Eldenoran bandits who attacked the village at Pine Peaks. Among the ashes of a campfire, you find a small, soot-blackened silver seal, which bears the star emblem of Eldenora. You wish to keep this silver seal, recorded on your action chart as a special item. Of course, I wish to keep this silver seal.
Once satisfied that there is nothing else here of interest or value, you return with the troop to the Red Rock and continue east along the main trail. It is near dusk when you emerge from the hills and see the glimmering waters of the River Kinam, less than five miles distant. This great river marks the border between Telestria and Palmyrian, Queen of Ain's neighboring ally. The road descends to a border toll bridge beyond which you can see the sprawling town of Skade. The troop is challenged by the bridge warden to halt and pay a fee of 100 silver loon. This fee is soon forgotten, though, when the Lord Constable shows the pedantic old man his royal seal. With a stiff salute, he steps aside and bids you all a safe journey. Alright, well that was actually useful. Thanks, escort guy. Skade is a bustling market town which has grown rich and fat in the years following the defeat of the Dark Lords. Its brightly painted buildings and paved thoroughfares exude affluence, and even its lowly street beggars look clean and well-fed by comparison to those in other parts of Magnamund. Nathor leads the troop to an inn near the center of the town, a fine establishment called the Lucky Bucket. Its owner, a corpulent fellow with a polished bald pate, welcomes him with open arms. After the ordeal at Pine Peaks and the long day's ride, you are looking forward to a hot bath and a large supper. However, it soon transpires that the inn is almost full, and the owner can only provide rooms for five of the troop. <laughs> you mean you didn't chip him the hundred loon anyway? I know, right? He's just dropping loon left and right. I mean, fuck it. It's like one of those bricks in Super Mario Brothers. Every time you jump up and hit it, another coin pops out over and over. Like that. Not to worry, says Nathor, noticing the look of disappointment on your face. I know Knight Tranius, a lord of this manor. Many is the time we hunted boar in the hills. His castle is but two miles from here. Five can billet here tonight while the rest of us lodge with Tranius. You agree to Nathor's proposal and set off with him, accompanied by three of the troopers along a river track which heads north to Castle Tranius. Oh, we're splitting up! We're splitting the party! Some of these dudes are dead. Some of these dudes are dead. We're splitting the party. That never goes well. Apparently this is a bridge with some serious statues on it. The river track runs parallel to the Kinam for nearly a mile before bearing east and entering a coppice of tall conifers. What the fuck is a coppice? I've never seen that word before. Coppice. It's an area of woodland in which the trees or shrubs are, or formerly were, periodically cut back to ground level to stimulate growth and provide firewood or timber. Right. Okay. Well, we're in a coppice, yo. A coppice of conifers. On the far side of this cultivated wood, you come to a bridge across a wide, fast-flowing tributary of the Kinem. The parapet of the bridge is lined with imposing stone statues, each depicting a past lord of Skade Manor. That's going to be awkward when they're out of room on the bridge for new statues, and then you're the lord, and they're like, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, go to the oldest one and wreck and destroy that one and <laughs> make room for me. In the distance, you can now see Castle Tranius. Its curtain wall and fortified barbican are illuminated by torches, which were lit, as is the custom here, an hour before sunset. On arriving at the gatehouse, Lord Nathor and the rest of you are welcomed into the castle keep, where your horses are attended to. A trio of Knight Tranius's guards come to escort you to his hall, and as you follow them to the castle's upper chambers, Nathor asks after Gwetor the Boar Master, the leader of Knight Tranius's hunt. He's no longer with us, answers one of the guards tersely. He's gone away. Uh oh, that sounds like some drama. 
Nox Moose says, Meanwhile, the five soldiers get devoured by the screeching Kron from the monastery. <laughs> yeah. Before Nathor can inquire further as to the whereabouts of his old hunting instructor, you were ushered into the castle's main hall and asked to wait a few minutes for Knight Tranius to arrive. Sure, I got nothing better to do. The fate of the world's not on my shoulders and shit. The hall is lit by a hundred sputtering candles and the light of a log fire which blazes in the chamber's imposing stone hearth. Three tall arched windows, each glazed with stained glass panels, are set into the south wall, and an impressive collection of books and fine tapestries line the others. Clearly, Knight Tranius is a refined man whose tastes extend beyond hunting the occasional boar. After a few minutes, a concealed panel beside the fireplace slides open, and a broad-shouldered man clad in a wolf-skin coat and a silver helm steps into the hall. Wait a minute, he's just relaxing in his own fucking castle? Just chillin' and he's wearing a fucking helm? I don't trust anybody that wears a helm while they're hanging out in their own house. Don't trust him. Hail, Trenius, says Nathor. It's good to... The Lord Constable's words of greeting die in his throat, and immediately you sense that something is very wrong. You hear a bolt slide shut outside the door to the hall, sealing it closed, and your Kai senses suddenly scream a warning of impending danger. You're not Tranius, shouts Nathor at the shadowy figure at the end of the hall. By the gods, who are you? See? See? He's wearing a helm to hide the fact that he's not actually him. See? When I said I don't trust him. My instincts, yo. My instincts. They, they serve me well. Alright. Of course I possess the Somrus word. I'm not some noob. I'm a son... Th I'm a grand thane, dude. I'm a grand fucking thane. Hashtag thane life. <laughs> Alright, I possess the Somrus word. Let's do this. It's gonna be a tough fight probably now because I have that. The figure beside the fireplace does not reply. Instead, it stretches out a gloved hand and takes up an iron rod which is lying upon the stone mantle. The moment its fingers close around the haft, a crackling blue flame ignites at its tip. Apparently this is what the rod looks like. Draw steel, commands Nathor, and his men respond by unsheathing their swords in readiness for combat. The Somers word hums with power as you release it from its scabbard and hold it before your face. You sense that the figure is not human. It possesses an aura of evil that marks it as a dark disciple, a magician versed in the forbidden black arts of the Nazaranim. Probably an assassin that animated the bridge statues to exterminate Lone Wolf. <laughs> yeah. Of course he's a bad guy. Everybody's a bad guy. Suddenly, there was a low concussive boom, and a spiral of blue flame shoots the length of the hall, fired from the tip of the figure's iron stave. It connects with the blade of your divine sword and rebounds, shattering one of the tall windows into a thousand glittering shards. Take him! shouts Nathor, and his men rush forward. But a second blast from the stave puts an end to their brave advance. Oh, these guys are starting to drop like flies now. All three are cut down by an arc of blue fire that leaves their corpses heaped and smoldering in the middle of the hall. Nathor curses the sinister figure, and it responds by uttering a chilling, inhuman laugh. This was a great idea, Nathor. I'm really glad we came here. This was your fucking plan. Good one. Good one, Nathor. Lord fucking Tranius' castle is getting a really bad TripAdvisor review from me. Uttering a chilling, inhuman laugh, now you sense a new danger approaching. The being's sickly laughter is summoning its minions to the hall. Alright, he summons ads. Of course he does. Lord Nathor, you cry. We cannot prevail here. We must escape. Follow me. 
And with these words, he raced to the window and leaped feet first through the shattered pane. Come on, lone wolf, why you scurred? Why are you being all scared? Stand and fight! Kill some fucking... dudes. Lone Wolf is running away. Alright. Random number time. Let's do this. I got a five. I got a five piece. It gets me into the top bracket. For a few moments, you hurtle through the cold night air, oblivious to your surroundings. Then, in a terrifying instant, you glimpse the flagstones of the keep and the roof of the castle stables. They are more than a hundred feet below. Nox says this might be the guy that Lord Natho borrowed all that loon from and never paid him back. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Your stomach churns with fear as you watch the hard, unyielding flagstones of the keep come rushing towards you at dizzying speed. I don't have Kai Alchemy, so whatevs. I have Grand Nexus, though. Can I telekinese myself? Alright, let's turn to 137 and take some damage. Oof. You steal yourself for the impact, but you hit the flagstones with such numbing force that your preparation does little to lessen the injuries you receive to your legs and body. Lose 12. 12 endurance points. It hurts. I'm really glad I jumped out that window. That was a fucking brilliant plan. Moments later, you are hit by Nathor, who comes crashing down upon your prone form. Your body softens his fall, but even so, the impact leaves him with a broken left ankle and severe cuts to his face and hands. Despite his obvious pain, he manages to smile when he realizes that you are both still alive, revealing gaps where he is now missing two of his front teeth. All he wants for Christmas are his two front teeth. Using your natural Kai curing skills, you repair your internal injuries sufficiently for you to be able to stand and assist your companion. Bravely, Nathor stifles his urge to scream as you take hold of his shattered ankle. You summon your healing powers and transmit them through your hands to his injured foot. Reduce your endurance score by a further four points. Okay. Fucking Nathor. This failure, I blame you for. I blame you for all of this, Nathor. You're the worst guide-slash-escort dude I've ever had. You feel the warmth of your power start to reduce the swollen tissues and mend the broken bone. But before you can complete the cure, a yelling horde of bogus castle guardsmen comes rushing out of the gatehouse with their swords drawn. Cursing your luck, you unsheathe your weapon and crouch in readiness to meet their manic attack. Why it gotta be manic? Why, why I gotta be manic? I'm manic. You don't see me attacking people. Alright. Imposters. So these guys have significantly more combat skill, but they're not immune to mental attacks, so... I'm gonna drop it on them. I'm gonna drop my now improved Mind Blast on them for a total of 4 coming off their combat skill. So they'll have a 44 modified. Which puts them at minus 10, which is almost the best. So I should wreck these guys pretty easy. Alright, Castle Guardsmen, here we go. Round 1, 40 versus 48. BOOM! One-shotted! That's what I'm talking about. I just spun around and did some crazy pirouettes and my sword just... Whoosh, 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 made that sound and went... Whoosh, 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 whoosh. I don't know why it would make that sound, because that's not what sword sounds like, but whatever. It goes... Whoosh, 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 and, like... All of their... They just die. Just blood sprays everywhere. It's crazy town. Alright, cool. One more time. Just like that. Alright, so... We killed the Castle Guardsmen like it weren't no problem. We start healing up. You leap over the heaped bodies of the bogus Castle Guardsmen and sheathe your bloodied weapon. Then you take hold of Nathor and carry him into the stables where you heave him across the neck of a saddled horse. Quickly you mount this steed and urge it to the gallop, bursting forth from the stable doors at a breakneck speed. Outside, the castle keep is alive with screams and curses as you steer your horse towards the gatehouse, where, to your mounting horror, you see that the portcullis is beginning to fall. 
Manically pirouetted to one shot out of the guardsmen, yes. Shit was manic as fuck. Pick a random number. If you have Telenosis, and uh, add two. If you have Grand Hunt Mastery, add two. If you have Animal Mastery, add one. So I get to add all the numbers. I can't even fail this, even if I roll a zero. I can't even fail this. I rolled a six, so whatever. I got this, no problem. I bet that two or less. If you get to add all this, that two or less is an instant fucking death right there. All right, let's do this. Keep healing. You race through the gatehouse arch just moments before the heavy portcullis comes crashing down. Without daring to look back, you urge your horse across the wooden drawbridge and along the open track that lies beyond. The angry shouts of the gate guards echo from the battlements, but so too do the unexpected sounds of clanking chains and baying hounds. You have covered more than half a mile when you chance a glance over your shoulder. To your dismay, you see that you are being pursued by a snarling pack of wolf-like creatures with drooling fangs and eyes that gleam menacingly in the darkness. An icy chill invades your heart. Here we go! We're back to the icy chill! Icy chill is back! Return of the chill. These are no ordinary hunting hounds. These are hellish beasts born of a dark sorcery. And Lone Wolf one-shotted them right after face-planting from the tower and having someone else fall on him. <laughs> yeah. Soon you reach the tributary bridge that is lined with statues, and you catch sight of the twinkling lights of Skade about a mile beyond. The feral pack are closing fast, and you know that your encumbered horse cannot outpace them indefinitely. You must do something to delay them if you and Nathor are to escape in one piece. Why don't I stop, get off my horse, and kill them all? I don't have Magi Magic. I do have Kai Surge and Grand Thane. So I can psychically blast some dogs or whatever. Man, I'm glad I picked up Kai Surge. I've gotten to use Kai Surge a lot in this book already. Usually it doesn't work that way. Usually you take a new ability and you never get to fucking use it in that book just because the game is mocking you, but this time, it's actually working out well. Yeah, I'll Kai Surge some dogs, some hell dogs, some hell hounds, whatever they are. Some bar guests, perhaps, I don't know. Depends on... I also heal myself. You cross to the far side of the river and wait there as the first few wolf creatures come racing towards the bridge. The pack leader is a massive brute with ghastly yellow eyes that seem to follow your every move. The moment he reaches the bridge approach, you focus your psychic power at the nearest statue. Oh, this is my blowing up objects thing that I now have, that I just read about at the beginning. Yeah, I can make objects explode. Your concentrated pulse of psychic energy shatters this sculpture with devastating effect, peppering the hellish beast with razor-sharp shards of stone. Shit, yeah. Let's roll some random number. I got a four. Yeah, four or higher. That's what I'm talking about. I just killed a dog by blowing up a statue on it. With my mind. The pack leader is torn to shreds by the blast, and several of his followers are left mortally wounded. The sight of their injuries, coupled with the deafening sound of the unexpected explosion, is more than the remaining pack members can bear. With a howl of fear and frustration, they turn away and race back to the safety of Castle Tranius. If this was a video game, and I was playing this, and I just got this ability, and I used it for the first time, and it was this awesome, I would be like, oh my god, I'm using this ability from now on. I'm never even going to kill anything with my sword ever again. All I'm ever going to do is blow up objects to kill enemies from now on. That's what I'd basically be saying right now if, if this was a video game. You ride to Skade with all the speed your exhausted horse can muster, and return at once to the Lucky Bucket Inn where the remaining members of your troop are billeted. The news of your encounter at Castle Tranius comes as a shock, 
both to the troopers and to the innkeeper who fears for the safety of the real Knight Tranius. I haven't seen him in the town for near on a week, he says, anxiously rubbing his mini chins. We here had no inkling that something bad was happening up there at the castle. It's right put the shakes up me, I can tell you. In the warm comfort of the inn, you use your Kai healing skills to mend the Lord Constable's injuries. He is carefully testing his weight on his newly mended ankle when suddenly there is a commotion outside in the street. An angry mob of hard-faced men, many clutching torches, staves, and coils of rope, are marching down the cobbled avenue towards the inn. Hang the Telestrian thieves! they shout. String up the murder and swine! What's going on? Who are these men? says Nathor. The innkeeper's face turns white and he begins to tremble with fear. I, I don't rightly know, he stammers. I ain't never seen him before. He's not from these parts. We've never had no quarrel with Telestria. You've always been our friends. Suddenly a chunk of cobblestone smashes through a window and an angry cry arises from the mob. Come out, you Telestrian dogs! Come out or we'll burn you out! Nathor calls everyone to the rear of the inn, where a passage leads directly to the stables. I fear this is some kind of crude ploy to murder you, Grandmaster. If you're to stand any chance of reaching your homeland, you must continue your journey at once. I and my men will do what we can to hold this mob at bay, but you must leave now and you must go alone, finally. This is where I lose the rest of my escort. Another window shatters and a burning brand is hurled into the inn. Very well, you reply uneasily. I shall leave at once. I'm out ease. After bidding a hurried farewell to the Lord Constable and his men, you take a fresh horse and leave the inn by a door at the rear of the stables. Some of the mob have gathered in an adjoining alleyway, but aided by your Kai camouflage skills, you evade these bloodthirsty thugs with ease. Keeping to the smaller alleys and passages, you make your way across Skade unseen, and then head north towards the open plains. You ride all night, using your infravision to help guide your horse through the lush grasslands and keep watch for potential dangers. As the hours slip past, you cannot help but think about Nathor and the men of his troop. They are risking their lives by staying behind as bait for the mob. You admire their courage, and it strengthens your resolve to return home to Somerland. Should the Lord Constable and his men have to pay for your escape with their lives, then you are determined that their sacrifice shall not be a wasted one. Pretty sure the Lord Constable can just pay for my escape with Loon. Also, he kind of deserves this after the terrible idea to go to fucking fake Knight Evil Castle place. Probably not its actual name. During your long night ride, unless you possess the discipline of Grand Hunt Mastery, you must eat a meal or lose three endurance points. I do. It was one of the first ones I took, as a matter of fact. Thank you, though. Continue to just go to 75. I'm going to heal myself up some more. In the twilight before dawn, you catch sight of the River Kinnam, less than a mile away to the west. You scan the surrounding landscape and note several small tracks which lead to tiny farmsteads dotted around this vast plain, converging at a hamlet which nestles in a bend of this great river. During the past hour, your horse has developed a slight limp, and a cursory look at his affected leg reveals that he has thrown a shoe. You know that unless you replace the missing shoe, and soon, he will be too lame to carry you further. Reluctantly, you decide to enter the hamlet and go in search of a blacksmith. A signpost at the entrance to the hamlet announces its name, Kalma. It is a quiet, sleepy sort of place that in many ways reminds you of Dage, the Somlending village where you were born and where you spent your early years. Near the center of this humble village, you discover a smithy, where, even at this early hour, you can hear the sound of a hammer beating iron. You tether your horse to a rail alongside a moth-eaten old donkey and call out for the blacksmith. 
In here! Comes the curt reply. On entering, you discover a tall, broad-shouldered man clad in a leather apron, busily shaping a horseshoe on an anvil. That's convenient. My steed has shed a shoe, you say. Can you replace it? Aye, he says, without bothering to look up from his work. But it'll cost you twenty loon, in cash and in advance, if you please. Actually, I can't afford that. Man, see, this is the money book. You were right. I'm going to save my crowns. And spend the 20 loon. You place five gold crowns. The note says you can pay in loon if you have it. On the blacksmith's anvil, remember to adjust your action chart, as he nods his approval. Leave your horse outside and come back in an hour. I'll have it done by then. You know, I think I will keep my loon and spend the crowns in case... I like keeping these alternate currencies in case there's ever a time when there's somebody that will only take that currency. Then I'm, then I'm covered. You know? Oh, Wolf, it's okay. Just put it on Lord Nathor's tab. <laughs> no shit, right? All right. An hour? I ain't got time for all that. I just want to say, we have not come very far. We have been reading this book for a long time now, and we have not come very far at all. We started in Garth, and we made it to Kalma. That's it. We're in Kalma. We made it to Skade, and then we went north to Kalma, apparently. We, we've only made it that far out of this journey of incredible length. It's not looking good. It's not looking good. We're not going to make it there in time. All right, let's read this. The sun is now above the horizon, and this hamlet is slowly stirring to life. You decide to while away the next hour or so by looking around at simple shops and riverside stores. One building in particular catches your eye. It is a hall perched precariously on the end of a wide wooden jetty. You can hear an old man's voice trailing from its open doors, answered by the occasional murmur of a crowd. Inside, you discover a wizened old cleric administering to a sick woman whose head is swathed with bandages. The cleric is attempting to cure the woman of her ills by laying on his hands, but the pressure is simply making the pain in her head feel worse. Charlatan, mumbles, mumbles one onlooker. Old fake, whispers another. The aged cleric hears these dissenting voices and he becomes flustered. Although he may be incompetent as a healer, you sense that he is a good man at heart, and so you decide to save him from the disgruntled crowd, who look as if they are on the brink of throwing him in the river at any moment. Hold, good brother, you say, moving swiftly through the crowd to the small stage on which he and the bandaged woman are standing. You should not be placing your hands upon this good woman's head. Surely the source of her pain stems from her aching heart. Apparently I'm a doctor now. Diagnosing and shit. And with this, you take hold of the man's hands and place them on the woman's chest. Her first reaction is one of shock, and she starts to pull away. But when you transmit your own healing powers through the cleric's hands and into her body, the pain in her head suddenly vanishes. A smile of pure joy lights up her face, and hurriedly, she strips off her bandages. It shall be praised! She cries. I'm cured! I'm completely cured! She's very happy. I don't know why she sounds like that. Just something happened to her when she's a kid. It just, <laughs> just got hit in the head or something. It just trust me. It's bad news. All right. And speaking of healing, I've used up my I've used my healing powers a lot in this book as well. The woman reaches to her purse and counts out forty silver loon into the cleric's trembling hands. Where the fuck is my cut? And all the while, she praises him loudly for taking the pain from her head. 
the cleric, whose name is Matho, sheepishly accepts her generous donation. Then, quite suddenly, he is swamped by the crowd of onlookers who all rush the stage at once. Each one waves a money purse and demands that he cure them as well. The frail old man is in danger of being crushed to death until you rescue him from this agitated crowd. Once safely outside, he offers you all of the woman's donation, for he knows only too well that it was your healing abilities which cured her and not his own. Okay, this guy's honest. This guy's honest. Uh, will I accept this money? 40 loon? Uh, yeah, of course I will, actually. Where does that put me at here? Forty loon is like ten gold crowns. This is like fifteen gold crowns. This is like seven. It's like twenty-two and ten. It's thirty-two. I'm still well below my limit. It would be kind of ironic if you were crushed to death by a mob of injured people demanding to heal him. <laughs> that would be awesome. Where are you bound for, stranger? He asks. The east, you reply. That's where I've journeyed from. Perhaps I can offer you a word of caution, eh? There's plague in the Stormlands this year. You'd be well to avoid the region if you can. If you can, well, this potion will protect you. I can at least guarantee that. The old cleric pulls a small flask from his pocket and offers it to you. If you wish to accept this potion, record it on your action chart as Matho's Potion. Of course I do. Well, it didn't say it's a special item, so it goes in my inventory. So, I'm going to get rid of a meal. Matho's Potion, that sounds like it deserves a trademark. There we go. Bam. Then the old cleric accompanies you back to the blacksmithy, where he too is having his mount reshoed. You collect your horse, and he collects his ragged old mule. Then you bid each other good luck and farewell before going your separate ways. Bye, Matho. That dude was legit. He gave me 40 loon and a potion. That's like his only legit healing item, yeah. Oh, more healing for me. You leave Kalma and ride due east along a dusty track. Mile after mile of featureless grassland passes by on either side until, late in the afternoon, you enter a range of gentle wooded hills. You have not gone very far before you discover a stream of sparkling water that is teeming with trout. Feeling tired and hungry, you decide to rest here and try your luck at catching some fresh fish for your supper. Grand Hot Mastery. It's not really luck. I'm like a master of getting food. Don't even trip. I got this. Within half an hour, you have collected six fine speckled specimens of... Oh man, they should have... They... Ball dropped right there. That should have been a word starting with S instead of fine, and that would have been a super awesome uh, alliteration right there. Instead of fine, it could be like... I don't know. Now I can't think of a word. I mean, I'm thinking of words, but they all sound stupid. Maybe that's what happened to Joe, too. He was like, I could put a S word in there and it would be awesome, but I can't think of one that doesn't sound dumb. So, 
Six fine speckled specimens of Palmyrian trout. More than enough to sate your ravenous appetite. You are about to construct a small campfire on which to cook them when suddenly you hear the sound of a wagon and horses approaching along the hill track from the east. Rather than run the risk of being confronted by bandits, you take cover behind a bush and wait for the wagon to appear. Known wolf hiding again. I'm a grand fucking thane. This isn't like the old days when I was just a Kai initiate and I hid from everything. I'm a grand thane. Motherfuckers should be hiding from me. Slippery. That'd be good, Noxmoose. Six slippery speckled specimens. Nice. More heals for myself. Through the foliage, you see six well-armed horsemen riding two abreast. They are followed by a carriage, behind which there are another two horsemen guarding the rear. The coach is quite small, suitable for no more than two passengers at most, and its lacquered black wood looks dull. It is covered with the dust of a long journey. It has curtained windows, and a crest adorns its doors. As they draw closer, you see one of the leading horsemen raise his hand to bring the column to a halt. Your heart sinks when you realize that he has seen your horse. Oh yeah, genius, lone wolf. I'm gonna hide behind the bushes, they won't know I'm here. Oh, but my giant ass horse is just standing right there. Rather than take the risk of losing your mount, you call out to the horseman, commanding him to continue on his way. Show yourself! He shouts in reply and draws his saber. Unless you be a brigand, you have no need to fear us. You remain hidden for a few moments longer, using your Kai skills to determine their purpose. When you can detect no aura of evil about them, you rise from behind the bush so that you can be seen. A pale hand parts the carriage curtains and you glimpse the face of a handsome young woman with jet black hair. Judging by the finery of her dress and the elegance of her demeanor, you assess her to be of noble birth. It's the equivalent of an ostrich sticking its head in the sand? Yeah. You, sir, she calls with a refined Palmyrian accent. I, I know you. Please, won't you approach my coach so that I can be sure? Uh. I'm not feeling that voice. What, what, what? What? She knows me. Lone Wolf has met, like, two women ever in the entirety of all the books. He knows no women. What the hell? We'll do as she requests, though. Why not? Intrigued by the young woman's high-bred charms, you step away from the bushes and approach her carriage door. Why, yes, she says excitedly. You are the Northland warrior they call Lone Wolf, are you not? I was in attendance at the Elector's court the day he awarded you the Star of Palmyrian for your victory over the Senna Druids of Rule. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was there. I did that. I am honored to meet with you in person, brave sir. How are you? Okay. She's got a hell of a hat there. The carriage door swings open and the beautiful young woman steps gracefully out onto the stony trail. May I be so bold as to introduce myself, she says, pausing to adjust a broad-brimmed hat which is trimmed with black corvail fur, as silky smooth as her flowing hair. I am the Baroness Corrine of the Lucia province. She offers her delicate hand and you kiss it in deference to her noble rank. Out of the corner of your eye, you notice the leading horseman dismount and come to stand protectively by her side. So here's the Baroness. I don't know what the fuck this is. Is this her handbag? Is it just some random giant fur? It's like, it's like a bathroom rug folded over right there. It's about the right size. So she's carrying a small bathroom rug around for some reason that no one can determine. The Baroness is a little bit crazy. Look, there's some madness in those eyes. Also, this hat? What the fuck? It's a ridiculous looking hat.
Maybe it's a towel. Maybe she's got herself a towel. I want, I want her towel. Give me the towel. Oh, and this is my personal guard, Dorst. That outfit reminds you of the Capital Women in the Hunger Games series? Yeah. You give the gruff-looking fellow a slight bow, and he nods his head in response, albeit begrudgingly. We are returning from a visit to my cousin's estate. We were hoping to reach Kalma by sunset, but we were delayed by bandits, she says, almost apologetically. We made them pay dearly for wasting our time, though, adds Dorst with quiet menace. It appears that we shall now have to encamp here in the hills this night, says the Baroness. Perhaps you would care to join us, my lord. It would feel so much safer if you did. Despite Dorst's cutting glances, you agree to the Baroness's proposal. Then you produce the six trout that you caught earlier and offer them to her as a gift. Why, thank you, she says with a wide smile. They look delicious. Uh, raw fish just caught do not look delicious. They look like fucking nasty ass fish. Just saying. So this is more conversation with a woman than Lone Wolf has ever had in the history of all the books up till now. I'm gonna keep healing. All the way up, apparently. You help the Baroness's entourage to set up a camp beside the stream, while Dorst, who considers himself something of a master cook, prepares the trout you caught earlier. To your surprise, the meal turns out to be excellent. Restore three endurance points. Lone Wolf, OMG, a woman! Lone Wolf, here's my trout. <laughs> I don't know what to say to her. Uh, I got fish! <laughs> During supper, you ask the Baroness what news she has heard of events in the East. She tells you that there is war between the principalities of the Stormlands, although this is such a common condition that it can hardly be considered news anymore. Of distant Summerland, she has heard nothing. After supper, she excuses herself and retires to her carriage. Dorst posts two men to guard her coach, and then he invites you to play cards with himself and the remaining five men. Are we going to play Gwent? Let's play some Gwent. Yeah, I'll play cards with him. Why not? Why not? I'm a little concerned, though. I don't know that I can trust this woman. The last person I, I knew of in a, in a story called The Baroness was from G.I. Joe. And The Baroness in G.I. Joe is not a good person. So. She even kind of looks like her, honestly. Kind of looks like The Baroness. From G.I. Joe. Collected G.I. Joe toys when I was a little kid. Alright, I'll accept his offer. Dorst spreads out an oilskin blanket, and you all gather round, seating yourself cross-legged on the ground. He then deals five cards to each man, and opens the betting with a stake of five loon. The game is Toluca, common in the inns of Palmyrian, and especially popular among professional gamblers. With your Kai abilities, it is easy for you to know every card that is being played, and so, rather than risk being called a cheat, you simply go through the motions of playing the game, maintaining exactly the same amount of money you begin with. After half an hour or so, you suddenly realize that Dorst is cheating. Hmm. Will I expose his cheating? Why not? Let's cause some drama. Let's fucking bust out some drama. You grab Dorst by the wrist and shake a dozen cards from his sleeve. A deathly silence descends on the group as all eyes look first at the cards, and then at you. Simultaneously, the men start to laugh like hyenas until tears are soon streaming down their faces. One by one, they jiggle their hands over the blanket, and hidden cards cascade from all their sleeves. They're all cheating? What the fuck? And I'm basically cheating too, using my mind powers. Did you not know, Northlander? Chuckles Dorst. That cheating is fair in Toluca. 
least that's the way we play it, eh, boys? Feeling a little embarrassed by their behavior, you fold your hand of cards, pick up your money, and make an excuse that you are tired after your long day's ride. So now Lone Wolf comes across as a douche. Dorst and his men bid you good night, and as he and his men continue with their dubious game, you go and check to see that your horse is comfortable for the night. You are busy gathering some grasses for his feed, when suddenly a shriek echoes through the hills. It is the unmistakable cry of a cron. Hashtag cron cry. Alright, I possess Kai screen. Shit, yeah, I do. Let's Kai screen it up. Shield myself from the cron senses or whatever, or the whatever psychic things on his back. Instinctively, you crouch down and take cover amongst the nearby foliage. You also call upon your Kai camouflage and psychic skills to help mask your presence from the creature which is circling high above the trees. For several minutes, you stare at the loathsome creature, not daring to move a muscle. Then you see it fly away and you breathe a sigh of relief. A chill night wind whistles through the trees and you shiver. But it is not the cold that is chilling your blood. It is the sudden fear that you may never see your homeland again. Also, Lone Wolf is just prone to all kinds of chills running up his spine and chills gripping his heart and chills... You know... Chilling him in various ways. Dorst doubles the guard in case the Kron should decide to return during the night. Then he and the others unpack their sleeping furs and settle down to a night's rest beside the warmth of the campfire embers. For an hour you lie awake, staring uneasily at the sky, until fatigue finally overtakes you and you slip into a deep sleep. Lone Wolf so chill. <laughs> yeah. You are woken at dawn by one of Dorst's men who immediately hands you a steaming mug of huas, a delicious Palmyrian beverage. You notice the others are in various states of waking, and as you sip your reviving drink, you watch Dorst shaving at the stream. See, that sounds creepy. Dorst is over there sh is shaving at the stream, right? He looks over and he notices Lone Wolf is just sitting there staring at him. <laughs> like, so he's like, whatever. He keeps shaving, keeps shaving. He looks over again, Lone Wolf's still just staring at him. He's <laughs> like, what the fuck, dude? After a while, the Baroness emerges from her carriage. She appears as fresh as a spring flower, and together, you breakfast before the camp is struck, and you go your separate ways. If you ever visit Lucia Province, she says, leaning from the open window of her carriage, be sure to visit my estate in Godorvo. I would be honored, my lady, you reply, and wave to her until at last her carriage and riders disappear into the hills. So that's it. It took 18 books for Lone Wolf to finally meet a girl. She invited him over, you know. Lone Wolf could finally lose his virginity. He's like, he's so old now, too. It's been, what, 27 years? He started at 15. He's 42. He's 42. And all indication that he's never, he's never been with a woman. He just has to bring the trout, yeah. <laughs> the weather is warmer than of late, and you make good progress despite the poor condition of the road. An hour past midday, as you are crossing a treeless valley, you happen upon a young man praying at a wayside shrine. It's a Hellgast! Not a man, it's a Hellgast. I don't believe it. He is dressed in a guildsman tunic and cloak, and he appears to be unarmed. Unarmed? I kill unarmed people all the time. I sneak up behind him and I just kill him. Die, Hellgast! I stab him in the chest, and then he dies and he doesn't turn back into a Hellgast, and I'm like, uh, shit. I'm gonna stop and question him, because it's basically like investigating. The young man gets up off his knees and greets you with a friendly smile. He is unusually talkative for a guildsman, and you soon learn that his name is Frello, and that he is a journeyman from the Silversmiths Guild of Vanamore. Lone Wolf met a man named Frello. He was a friendly fellow. 
That's it. That's the whole poem. And then he is a journeyman from the Silversmiths Guild of Vanamore. He has stopped here to offer up a prayer to Ashir to protect him from bad strangers on the trail. It appears that he was robbed yesterday by some Eldenorans on the road out of Vanamore. He offers to share half a loaf of bread with you, but you decline his generosity, thanking him nonetheless. You sense that it is all the food he has. I could give him some food. I'm carrying around an extra meal. I could give this dude some food. I don't even need it. I literally don't even need it. I'm, I'm a fucking Grand Hunt Master. Mindful of wasting time, you bid him good luck and then continue your journey east. Oh my god, we're still 42 miles from Vanamore after all this time? Jeez. And, and like, let me just remind you, Vanamore is nowhere the fuck near where we need to go. Like, this is ridiculous, this journey. Eldenora, a lot of troublemakers come from there. This is Vanamore, okay? We haven't, we've only... We ha we've only come about like this far, say. And we have to go all the fucking way. All the way. Look at this. That's the. That's the. Imagine that I just drew a line for Vanamore that goes up here to the Kai Monastery. We have to go all the fucking way up there, and we've only come this far in the amount of time that we've been reading this book. What the fuck? All right. Beyond the valley lies an expanse of coarse and thorny vegetation, which is alive with wild game. You stop to catch yourself an evening meal, and then make camp beneath an old twisted oak. Restore three endurance points. Don't need it, I'm already full. The night passes uneventfully, and at first light you resume your ride east. Shortly before midday, you arrive at the ruins of an ancient church, where a signpost pointing to the east says Vanamore. Actually, it reads... Wait a minute, the signpost is talking! Ah ha! What the fuck? A talking signpost? What madness is this? Is it a mimic? Is it a magic mouth spell? Is it just some kind of like a live sentient signpost? Well, let's stop and have a chat with it. Well, if it's talking, I have to give it a voice too. A signpost pointing to the east says, Vanamore, 42 miles. You allow yourself a smile. With luck, you could be inside the city walls by nightfall. I'm not going to stop and have a conversation with the talking signpost. Later in the day, you see a dust cloud approaching along the road. You magnify your vision and see a dozen armed horsemen clad in ragged uniforms of green and black. A sense of unease pervades your mind. These are the colors most often worn by Eldenoran soldiers. Trusting to your Kai instincts, you steer your horse off the trail and take cover among the trees of a nearby copse. A chill runs down Lone Wolf's spine as he realizes it is really a talking wooden platform. <laughs> ah! Ah, I kill myself in fear. All right, let's pick a random number. I got a nine this time. Nice. I assume that's a good roll. As the writers approach, your initial suspicions are confirmed. These are unquestionably Eldenoran brigands. Their saddle cloths bear the emblem of their realm, and their steeds are laden with sacks and pouches that bulge with ill-gotten gains. You remain hidden until they have passed by, and then, to be doubly sure, you wait until the dust of their horses' hooves disappears beyond the horizon. During your wait, unless you possess Grand Hunt Mastery, you must eat a meal. So I'm sitting there, hiding, watching these guys, and hunting at the same time. Why don't I just- they have so much loot, though! I would totally jump out and kill these guys if I could, because they have so much loot. Also, if this was a video game, I would get the mod that lets you carry more than 50 gold crowns. Like, I would be on fucking Lone Wolf Nexus, <laughs> getting that fucking mod day one! <laughs> Fuck the 50 crown limit. Alright. You reach the city of Vanamore late in the evening, long after the sun has set beyond the western horizon. The guards at the west gate do not, at first, look kindly upon a travel-stained rider of unknown origin. But when you show them the Star of Palmyrian, 
The medal that their leader, the Elector Manatine, awarded you for your victory over the evil druids of Rule. Their cold attitude undergoes a dramatic change. Yeah, basically I just rolled up here. This is like just walking up wearing the Congressional Medal of Honor or something. <laughs> like, oh uh, yeah, What's the, this is just my Congressional Medal of Honor. It's no big deal. It's cool. It's cool. The president handed it to me personally, but it's, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Just, I, well, I saved the world. It's not. It just don't worry about it. I just saved the world. It's cool, though. Let's not make a big deal out of it. It's like that. Star of Palmyrian. The guard sergeant apologizes profusely and escorts you personally through the capital streets, past a well-ordered collection of dwellings and public buildings, to a grand palatial edifice in the city's northern quarter. It is the Elector's Hall, the seat of the Palmyrian Republic. Trumpets announce your arrival as you stride through the hall's great arched doors. Senators and officials stop momentarily to stare. Then their attentions return to their affairs of state, which strike you as unusually urgent. It is almost midnight, yet the Elector's Hall is a buzzing hive of activity. You meet with Elector Manatine in his war room, where he and his generals are poring over maps and battle reports. He welcomes you with a warm handshake, but his countenance seems unusually dour and agitated. You are soon to learn why. Now here's the deal, Elector Manatine. I don't have time for your fucking war. Whatever war you're in right now, I ain't got time to stop and help you with it. I really need to travel a ludicrously long way. All right, let's learn why. Dun dun dun. It is good to see you again, Grandmaster, he says, forcing a smile. I was expecting you. I received word yesterday from Queen Yvain, telling me of your urgent journey. Yet it is unfortunate that your visit should come at this time. I would have hoped to have given you the kind of welcome you truly deserve. The Elector then introduces you to his generals, who acknowledge you with soldierly salutes. As you can see, we are at war, Grandmaster. Knew it. He says, sweeping a hand over the maps which lie strewn across his state table. The new ruler of Eldenora, a low-born blackguard by the name of Luther, who dares to adorn himself with the title Prince of Duiton, is attempting to seize our northern territories. That's the guy who sent the assassins after me. Fucking Luther. I just keep thinking he should be played by Idris Elba. Because Idris Elba plays a character named Luther in a show named Luther. And if you just if you just pronounce it a certain way, I'd be like Luther. Luther. So I'm assuming that Idris Elba sent these guys to kill me. We are locked in battle with his army of cutthroats near Halona, and though it pains me to have to admit this, we're hard pressed to contain his advance. This war has come without warning, and we were ill prepared. We have few reserves insufficient to support the Holona garrison and to counter the many small units of Eldenoran horsemen who are ravaging our plains. This is a dark and testing time for us, Grandmaster, but even so, I shall aid you while I can. It's a cool looking ship. <gasps> it's a sky vessel! I was just looking at it, and I'm like, that looks like it's designed to fly, not designed for the sea, because it's got these... These, like, railing things, these runners, or whatever they are, kind of like a helicopter has, to land. And a, a sea ship wouldn't have those. A flying vessel, that's what I need. W it's about to be GTFV up in here, Grand Theft Flying Vessel, because I need that shit. I don't care about your stupid war. You learn that the Elector has already elicited on your behalf the help of High Mayor Cordus of Cassiorn. Cordus is reputedly the richest man in all of Magnamund. Oh, so that guy's got some loon. He's even richer than <laughs> he's even richer than what's his name. I've already forgotten his name. As soon as I left him behind, his name just left me. He was too unimportant. What was his name, Moo? What was his name? The fucking guy that was with us. The guy that was dropping all the money. 
I don't even remember. This craft is presently being built in Cassiorn, and the High Mayor has sent word that you should go there as quickly as you can. His teams of skilled artisans are working on the craft day and night, and he is confident that it will be completed in 15 days' time. That's a long time. My monastery is going to be fucking not only ashes, cold ashes by the time I get there. In times of peace, you would expect the 850 mile ride to Cassiorn to take little more than two weeks to complete. But peace, always a fragile state in the Stormlands, has been shattered by Prince Lutha's unprovoked attack on Halona, a town through which you had hoped to travel. Anxiously, you ask the Elector how the war against Eldenora will affect your chances of reaching Cassiorn swiftly. Sadly, I cannot predict the future, Grandmaster, he replies. The war bodes ill for both our causes. However, I shall do what I am able to speed your journey onwards. Lord Nathor. Yes, Nathor. I knew you'd remember. This guy's richer than Nathor. The Elector motions to one of his guardsmen who turns and leaves the war room. He soon returns with another soldier who wears the uniform of a captain. I'm pretty sure I have. Um... Let me look at the map again. So, Cassiorn, Halona. Let's see if we can see these places on the map. So we finally made it to Vanamore. We're here. God, we have barely gone any distance whatsoever. There's Halona, which is where the dude sees. There's Magaruith, which is where we fought the evil center druid. That's where we first met Kadak. Um, now where the fuck is this Cassiorn place? Cassiorn... Where is you, Cassiorn? I don't see Cassiorn anywhere. Do you see it? Is it just not on the map? Because that would be weird. Maybe it's not on the map. Or maybe I'm blind. Beneath the lake. Yes! There it is! Oh my god. I see it immediately. Beneath, it's the Mackenmeyer Swamp. It's right there. How did I not see that before? We've actually been through Cassiorn before. In an earlier book. We have. That's still far as shit. Oh my god. Oh, all we have to do is get to Cassior and then we can fly to the Kai Monastery. Cassiorn is far as fuck! You see how long it took us just to get from Garth into Vanamore? Cassior we just oh, we just need to jet over there to Cassiorn real quick. Then we can use the flying ship to go the rest of the way. Fuck. Hey True okay, how you doing? Good to see ya. All right, fine. That was ridiculous. I think I visited the Palmyrian military post at Stonewatch in a previous Lone Wolf adventure. I think I have. Captain, who's this captain? At once, you recognize the captain. It is Seer Main, the brave hero of the Darklands War, who guided you to Stonewatch and the Forest of Rule during your quest to thwart the Center Druids two years previously. Hail, Grandmaster, he says, his battle-scarred face beaming with delight. I am pleased to have been chosen by the Elector to escort you north to Halona. Ah, another escort. This didn't work out very well for the last escort. Well met, Captain, you reply, shaking his steel hand. Whoa! He's a fucking cyborg? What the fuck? This guy, he's got cybernetics? He's, or is he just like fucking Jamie Lannister with his one metal hand? Alright, I'm shaking his steel hand, trying to act like I don't notice. He's got a, you know, prosthetic. I don't want to stare and be a dick or anything. I could not have wished for a better traveling companion. 
Trio cases, can I have a recap on the book so far? Well, okay. Recap is this. We were really, really far away from our homeland. And we found out that our homeland, our home monastery, where our order of Kai recruits that are like our students that we've been raising up and training, have been attacked by some kind of army of dragon creatures. They're being attacked. So we're trying to rush home as fast as we can to save them. But it's really fucking far, and the journey is going very slowly. And we're just kind of slowly making our way across the land trying to get back to our homeland, and it's not going well so far. So, so that's pretty much, that's pretty much what the what the book's about so far. Elector Manatine permits you the use of his private chambers, which join the war room, where you are able to get a few hours sleep before dawn. Then, shortly after sunrise, you bid the Elector and his generals farewell and leave the city with Captain Sir Main in a military coach bound for Halona. An escort of cavalry outriders accompany this armored carriage in case you should meet unexpectedly with a unit of roving Eldenorans during your journey east. Thankfully, the journey proves swift and uneventful, and as the day is turning to dusk, you find yourself approaching the military outpost of Stonewatch. Okay, so we've been here before. Back during the, the Plague Lords of Rule, which I think was the first Grandmaster book, which probably would have made it like book 13. You stay at this fort overnight, and then continue on to Halona in the morning. For most of the journey, you experience a sense of unease, a premonition that something is wrong. But it is not until you catch sight of the city, shortly before noon, that your fears are realized. Uh-oh. Yeah, the Eldenorans are a banded empire led by Lutha who's been hiring assassins against me. Exactly. Nox will explain. <laughs> Nox understands what's going on in the book better than I do. I just read. I can't be bothered to pay attention to it as well. Now, my memory is just super bad. I already forget characters like 30 minutes after we just talked to him. Halona is in turmoil. The approach roads and outlying fields are littered with scores of broken wagons, dead horses, and the ruined impediments of war. Palmyrian soldiers sit dejectedly on the frost-hardened earth their glazed eyes and bandaged limbs bearing grim testimony to the bitter fighting that is taking place just a few miles to the north. Battle-weary officers ride among these exhausted men, cursing and coaxing them in a half-hearted attempt to rally them to arms. Few heed their call. And we have an illustration here. This is like dead horses. Pickets and, and this guy's limping along with a... These soldiers look fucked, is what happened. These soldiers got wrecked, and they're not loving life anymore. And their commanders are trying to rally them, and the soldiers are just like, nope, nope. They're just fucking noping this whole thing right now. Inside the city walls, the situation is tense. Every available dwelling is packed to overflowing with wounded soldiers, and the civilian populace, displaced from their homes by the army's needs, wander the streets and alleyways in a state of shocked confusion, greatly adding to the chaos. Captain Sirmain orders his driver to the Canitarium, the largest of Halona's municipal halls, where General Fucharl, the Palmyrian commander, has established his headquarters. On entering this crowded building, a young lieutenant rushes up to Sir Main and informs him that his son has been wounded in the battle now raging at the Roloni Bridge. I must go to him, Grandmaster, he says, his voice choked with emotion. I'm told that he has not long to live. Uh, I'll go with Captain Sir Main to see his wounded son, why not? You follow Sir Main and the young lieutenant out of the canitarium and along a crowded avenue towards a tented encampment to the city's main park. Here, under a canvas awning, the captain finds his mortally wounded son being attended to by an army physician. Will he pull through? asks Sir Main of the physician whose white surgical apron is stained deep crimson with the blood of all those he has attempted to save this day. The weary man does not answer. He simply shakes his head and leaves to attend yet another poor wretch who is crying out for him to end his suffering. We have illustration there, this guy's son. Apparently he's got a wound right there, blood coming out of it. 
blood coming out of his nose and mouth, so he's pretty messed up. That doctor's like, nope, <laughs> this dude is dead. But I have healing powers. I, I should be able to heal him. Like, I have really good healing powers. So your main son has a deep chest wound, which, on closer inspection, you determine was made by a poisoned arrow. The physician has removed the shaft, but the poison has long since entered the young man's bloodstream. His life is fast ebbing away, and you sense that there is very little you can do to save him. Except I do have deliverance, and I've reached Sun Knight or higher. I'm a healing mug, so let me just fix this guy up, no probs. Try to heal him, yeah, that's what we're gonna do. You focus your advanced Kai healing powers on the young man's wound and cause the punctured tissues to knit together. I take three points of damage. I'm healing so hard. Your treatment deadens his pain and revives him, but you know that this remission is but temporary. The poison in his blood is too strong and too well established to be neutralized by your Kai powers. Through clenched teeth, he forces himself to speak. You hear him tell his father that Prince Lutha's army is being aided by a sinister group of center druids. Those fucking druids again. Even once you kill Kadak, his men are still acting up. And renegade Nazarenum magicians. Lutha himself possesses a ring of power which bestows upon him an invulnerability to weapons. Well, that's a problem. The boy says this ring must be taken from him if he is to be slain. Gradually, the effects of your healing powers wear off, and the brave young man slips into a sleep from which he will not awaken. Well, he gave us some valuable intel, actually, before he died. That's good to know about the ring. Alright, we'll start healing ourselves here. Sir Main is overcome with grief by his son's death. With trembling hands, he takes the blood-stained tunic from beneath the young man's head, unfolds it, and drapes it over his lifeless body. To your surprise, you note the insignia on the lapels are similar to those on Sir Main's uniform. His son held the rank of captain, the same as his father. I must go to his regiment, he says, his voice wavering. It is right and fitting that I take command of them now. After attending to the burial of his son, the grieving captain returns to the canatarium to find out where his son's regiment is stationed. He learns they are at the Reloni Bridge, at the very heart of the battle. Before he leaves, he thanks you for trying to save his son's life, and suggests two routes by which you can reach the distant city of Cassiorn from here. The first route is the most direct, but it is also the most hazardous. It requires you to pass through the enemy lines at the Reloni Bridge, cross the southern tip of Eldenora, and then continue your journey north by way of the Slovarian Plain. The second route will avoid the fighting at the Reloni Bridge, but it would mean having to pass through the city of Duodon, Prince Lutha's stronghold. Hmm, this is a tough call. <coughs> You could have had one of those soldier officers whining at the injured soldiers to take over the regiment. Yeah. So, basically... I don't know where the fuck this bridge is, but... Do it on. Well, the thing is, I wouldn't want to avoid the fighting normally. I'd be like, fuck it, let's go right through the battle at the Reloni Bridge. But I don't want to avoid Prince Lutha either. I want to go confront him. If he's going to be sending assassins after me, he and I need to have some fucking words. So, I feel like I should go to Duodon and confront Prince Lutha. So we're going that way. Even though we avoid the, the battle at the Reloni Bridge, which is unfortunate... We're going after Prince Luth. So, do it on route. Sir Main provides you with a fresh horse from the Canatarium stables, and then he escorts you personally to the city's north gate. Good luck and Godspeed, Grandmaster, he says. May we meet again one day, 
but in happier circumstances. Yeah, hopefully. Under cover of darkness, you ride due north towards the border with Eldenora, less than eight miles distant. The hilly terrain and your natural camouflage skills enable you to evade the enemy's lookouts and pass into their territory unseen. At first, the going is easy, and you cover many miles despite the undulating ground. But shortly before dawn, you find yourself descending from the hills towards an expanse of marsh and reed beds. You try to avoid this bog and make a wide detour to the east, but before long you are brought to a halt at the edge of a steep ravine. Both ways ahead now look impossible on horseback, but you are loath to abandon your mount. You decide to turn back, yet you have gone no more than half a mile when your Kai's senses alert you to danger. In the distance, you see a regiment of Eldenoran cavalry on the move. You count more than a hundred riders. Rather than risk running afoul of them, you reluctantly re abandon your horse and return again to the edge of the ravine. Alright, so we lost our horse. We're gonna have to go on foot. We walk from here. Cross the ravine, cross the bog. Well, fuck a bunch of a bog. Nobody wants to go into a bog. Water always sucks. So of course we're gonna cross the ravine. The sides of the ravine are composed of gravel and shale, which is loose and treacherous underfoot. Yet your natural agility enables you to make the descent without too much difficulty. Climbing up the far side, however, proves to be a far harder task than expected. Why is water bad? It just is. Anytime you gotta go into water, there's always bad shit that happens. Nasty things live in the water, they try to suck you down, you get stuck in something, you lose your stuff. Basically, you know... There's just so much more that can go wrong, I think, in a bog than a than a ravine. The ravine, all that's going to go wrong is you're going to fucking fall and hurt yourself. Or maybe fall to your death, which is a problem, but whatever. I'm assuming that doesn't happen. A bog, though, all kinds of bad shit can happen in a bog. There's a reason they have the phrase, bogged down. Like, you don't want to get bogged down in something. They have that phrase because being in a bog sucks. <laughs> They don't ever say, don't get ravined down, do they? No. I don't possess Kai Alchemy, so I'm going to have to go to the loser section. With painstaking care, you inch your way up the side of the ravine. Bits of rock and soil crumble away beneath your feet with alarming regularity. And often, you are left dangling precariously in mid-air, holding on by just the fingers of one hand. You are within sight of the top, more than a hundred feet from the base of the ravine, when suddenly there is a thundering roar. You look up, and to your mounting horror, you see a deluge of rock and stone come tumbling towards your face. Okay, that's not good. That's not good, I'll admit it. Random number. That three or less fucking kills you, I'll bet. I have two. I do have a rope, though. I have a coil of oiled, oiled rope right here, and I have Grand Hot Mastery, so I get to add three. So as long as I don't roll a zero, I'll be fine. If I roll a zero, I'm fucked. If I roll a one or better, I got this. I'm not gonna roll a zero. Big number. No whammies. Boo! Oh! <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? You did not just do that to me, game. You did not just do that to me. Again, this has happened to me before, where uh, out of zero to nine, all I had to roll was a one or higher. All I had to roll was not a zero, and I rolled a fucking zero. Are you shitting me? Am I about to fall to my death right now? Is that what's going to happen? Because, uh, <laughs> damn it, a zero. All right. Maybe the bog would have been better. Yeah, man, I wish I was in a bog right now. All right, let's see what happens. I probably die. Yep. You press yourself as flat as you can against the sheer rock face of the ravine, but a heavy boulder glances your shoulder and you lose your precarious grip. Frantically, you scrabble for a handhold, but already you are falling backwards amidst a cloud of choking dust and loose shale. 
With a sickening thud, you smash headfirst into the boulder-strewn ground at the base of the ravine. Tragically, your life and your journey home come to an abrupt end here. Abrupt end here in Eldenora. So that's my first death for this book. I die in almost every book. Usually I die multiple times. Out of the 18 books, there's only been two of them that I didn't die in. So, death number one. There it is. Fuck me. Alright, we go back. Roll again. Got a nine. This is why water is good. Yeah, man, the bog would have been better. I didn't think the ravine was going to be this dangerous. Like, there was only a 10% chance of that happening. There was a 10% chance of me rolling the one number that would have killed me. You press yourself as flat as you can against the sheer rock face of the ravine and manage to hold tight until the deluge of loose shale ceases to fall. Once the dust is cleared, you find the remainder of the climb relatively easy and you scramble quickly to the top of the ravine. Oh my god, you're right. I forgot. Hold on. Very important. Tragically, your life and your journey come home. Tragically, I can't even read. This is a, a read, horn for my reading, too. Tragically, your life and your journey home come to an abrupt end here at Eldenora. It's critical. It's a critical ritual that has to happen when I fucking fail like that. All right. Once the dust is cleared, you find the remainder of the climb relatively easy, and you scramble quickly to the top of the ravine. There you pause for a few moments to check that your equipment is still intact, and then you hurry away from the ravine, heading north. Beyond the ravine, the land becomes increasingly barren. You press on, following a dried water course, to a plateau which is dotted with scrub and stunted pines. Here, beneath the twisted boughs of a dead tree, you make camp for the night and settle down to sleep. Before you rest, unless you possess grand hunt mastery, you must eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Soundboard. It's not a whole sound. It's not a soundboard. It's just one thing. It's 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 this. It's just this. Price is right. Losinghorn.com. <laughs> I have a little window open. On my other monitor with that in it and nothing else. It's what I play whenever I fucking like fail at something badly. Whenever I die. Alright. Let's move on. You are woken by the clammy sensation of fine cold spray on your face. Reluctantly, you prize open your sleep-clogged eyes and see that the sky above is uniformly gray, swaddled by a thick blanket of cloud. A fine drizzle is sweeping down across the plateau, but the darkening clouds above indicate that this is merely the prelude to heavier rain. Sure enough, within the hour, you find yourself trekking north through a torrential downpour. The heavy rain makes the going difficult, but you take some comfort in the fact that it will lessen the odds of a chance encounter with an Eldenoran patrol. Later in the day, you come to a ridge which overlooks a sizable town positioned at the center of a wide valley. A glance at your map confirms your suspicion that this town is Oridal, and when you magnify your vision, you see that it is swarming with Eldenoran troops and horsemen. Oridal. Let's take a look at the map. Bring back the map. Where the fuck is Oridal? Oh, we made it to here. So we've made it quite a distance from Vanamore and from Halona. And we're going to Duodon. So we're like halfway. That's good. You decide to give this town a wide berth and you stay in the hills to avoid the risk of being detected. For two days you live off the land as you make your way steadily northwards. Despite the bad weather and having to go on foot, you make excellent progress. 
On the morning of the third day, you come to a wood overlooking a small village called Nersha, which sits astride the main Rioma Road. In the center of this town, there is a junction where another wide road branches off to the east. A large signpost at the junction says, Ah, oh, it's another talking signpost! Abisco. Abisco, 40 miles! This signpost has that kind of voice. You see, normally Joe's, Joe catches that. Normally fucking Joe writes reads when it's, a, when it's, you know, something that just has something written on it. He usually does, but this time he's used says a couple of times now, which is not the word that he meant to use. Abisco. From the dry shelter of the wood, you observe the town for nearly an hour, but you detect no movement there whatsoever. The place appears to be completely deserted. I have Deliverance and Grand Pathsmanship, yes, yes I do. That's a strange combination, because that's the healing skill and the tracking skill combined. Your keen Kai senses, not super keen, detect a faint aroma in the air, a sickly sweet smell which you recognize immediately. It is the aroma of disease and decay, the ghastly, cloying smell of plague. Alerted by your acute Kai senses to the, tragically which is the tragedy which has befallen the town of Nersha, you skirt around its perimeter before taking the road which heads east towards Visco. Ah, so everybody in the town died of plague. Well, it's good that I'm not going into town and fucking around with the plague bodies then. It would not be a good time to go try to loot the bodies. It is early in the afternoon when you catch sight of a grand, half-timbered bridge in the far distance. It spans a river, swollen by the recent rains, which you recognize at once to be the River Reloni. How do I recognize it at once? I fucking recognize rivers now? Like, just any random part of a river? I say like, oh, I know what river that is. <laughs> yep, that's the River Reloni. I'd recognize that river anywhere. <laughs> I never forget a river. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? There is a small circular tent near the approach to the bridge, and three Eldenoran soldiers are seated on stools beside it, each smoking a long-stemmed pipe. At first, you consider avoiding the bridge and finding somewhere else to make a crossing, but the river is wide and fast-flowing, and the three guards look particularly weak and stupid. After some deliberation, you decide to try to bluff your way past them. I could just bluff them with my sword. By bluff, I mean kill. Anyway, good night. Hey, true, okay. Good night to you, too. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for chatting. I'll see you later. Have a good one. As you approach, one of the guards gets up off his stool and moves to stand in your way. Casually, he asks to see some sort of identification. I have a silver seal, actually. Don't I? I think I do. Yeah, I have a silver seal right there. Guided by your Kai instincts, you remove the seal from your tunic pocket and show it to the sallow-faced guard. He grunts his approval and then shuffles back to his cronies seated beside the tent. Calmly, you proceed to cross the bridge without paying them a second glance. That plague place was probably where that old cleric's potion would be used. Ah, uh, good call, Nox. That's probably right. That's probably right. And if you don't have it, you probably die. See? This time he used reeds. See? Usually he does. Usually he does. On the far side of the river, you notice a milestone half buried in a roadside ditch. Etched on its granite surface is a small arrow which points eastwards, and below reads the message, Abisco, 25 miles. Later, as you approach the outskirts of this town, you notice a large flock of carrion crows circling above its timbered buildings. You sense that plague has recently visited this town, and so you leave the road and spend the night in woodland a few miles to the south. The next day, the weather changes for the better. The temperature rises and the surface of the muddy road quickly becomes dry and hard. Ten miles east of Abisko, you see a small regiment of Eldenoran soldiers camped out beside the road. 
They are busy with their luckless duty of having to burn the bodies of Abisko's plague victims, which number in the hundreds. So preoccupied are they with their grim task that they fail to see you steal one of their horses. Oh, I got a horse again. Got good. And make off with it along the road which leads to Duodon, their capital city, which is where I'm headed to hopefully kill this Lutha guy. <laughs> you notice that these signposts don't have the power of speech and mutter something about old technology while reading the message. <laughs> like, fuck. Can't even have, don't even have, no voice acting? No voice acting? I've just got to read it myself? What is this? LOLOL, is this game from 1998? Alright, so... While riding the road to Duodon, you search the bags which hang from the saddle of your newfound horse. Among the things they contain are a spare Eldenoran uniform and rain cape. You throw the uniform away, but you sling the voluminous cape around your shoulders and fix the clasp under your chin. Why did I throw the uniform away? I could disguise myself. It, it's worked out well in the past when I've disguised myself. I could just wear the uniform and I wouldn't have to worry about all these patrols and, and regiments and shit that I'm seeing. Mindful of the increased risks of detection, I'm just going to assume the uniform didn't fit me, and that's why I threw it away. Not, I'm not, like, just a dumbass. The nearer you get to do a dawn. Mindful of the increased risks of detection, the nearer you get to do a dawn, this simple black cape serves two useful purposes. It keeps hidden your Kai clothes, and gives you the outward appearance of an Eldenoran horseman. You need not record this cape on your action chart. Among the other items you discover in the saddlebags are enough food for two meals, a mace, a rope, a tinderbox, eight loon, equivalent to two gold crowns, and a mirror. Do I want to keep any of these items? I'm carrying ten things now. A tinderbox sounds useful. I'm gonna get rid of this other meal. I'm gonna take that tinder box. <laughs> Nox says Lone Wolf doesn't care about the disguising. He just wanted the whooshing sound that the cape provides as he dashes around. <laughs> yeah, he just thinks it makes him look cool. All right. And I'm gonna take some loon, of course. Sixty-eight loon. I'm gonna do a little something here. Never mind, I'm not gonna do a little something here. It'll only let me type in... two things. Alright. During the remaining daylight hours, you frequently see units of Eldenorans on the road, most marching westwards with long pikes over their shoulders. None of them challenge you as you pass them by, for they assume you are a cavalry scout going about his duty. After spending a comfortable night in the loft of a deserted hay barn, you continue your ride at first light and reach the outskirts of Duodon shortly before midday. The Eldenoran capital is a gray and unlovely place. Its cold stone buildings bear the scars of a city whose history is one of near continual warfare. The roads leading to the city gates are crowded with regiments on the move, and soon you find yourself caught up to a large body of troops which is snaking slowly towards Duodon's heavily fortified western approach. The mood of the troops is one of studied indifference a condition which often prevails in those who have become emotionally numbed by the horrors of war. As this sullen mass moves through the west gate, you glance up at the battlements and notice a red-robed figure clutching a long staff of glowing white metal. A tingle of apprehension runs the length of your spine when you recognize the figure to be a center druid. Man, I'm about sick of those guys. 
The staff he holds radiates a magical aura, and you sense at once that he is scanning the arriving soldiers, using the staff to determine, amongst other things, if any have contracted plague. Suddenly the center becomes agitated, and he sprints the length of the battlements to sound an alarm bell. Within a few moments, the west gate is sealed by a heavy iron portcullis, and panic sweeps through the crowd, the troops who have been shut outside. You look up at the battlements once more, and this time your heart skips a beat. The center is pointing his glowing staff directly at your head. Dun dun dun. There's the top of the wall. And there's the druid guy, and he looks pretty surly, and he's got his glowing stick. From out of the crowd of panic-stricken soldiers, there bursts a unit of Duodon guards armed with spears and throwing nets. They are led by a bearded, one-eyed sergeant who barks an order at you to throw down your weapons and dismount from your horse. Do as I say, he growls murderously, or I'll cut out your liver and feed it to the crows. Um, I can do as he says, or I can tell him to go fuck himself. And I can somber sword some fools. I think we're going with option B, which probably leads to my death, but I don't care. Turn to, turning to 50. Let's kill some dudes. You draw your weapon and slay the first guard to come within arm's length of your horse. The others freeze in their tracks, stunned by the speed of your attack. But then the sergeant screams at them like a wild animal, and they rush forward again. They are more scared of their sergeant's wrath, it seems, than they are of your battle skill. You must fight them. Yeah, I'm not concerned. Let's take a look at the illustration. So they're wearing some, like, studded leather with some plates, maybe. They have nets. The nets seem like a problem. Yeah, these guys look like scrubs, though. I'm going to chop these goons up. Do it on guardsmen. Let's do this. They are not immune to mind blast or anything, so I'm going to use that on them, lowering their combat skill to 38. And uh, let's, let's tear them up. 56, 42, round one. Bam! One-shotted! Thank you! Another spinning pirouette of death. This time, my new cape, whooshing. Whooshing as as I as I cut them down like so much fucking wheat. All right. They are like stalks of wheat. The summer sword is my scythe, and it's fucking harvest time. All right. Just saying, they're dead. Cape of Doom. I won. Having slain all of the guardsmen and their sergeant with stunning ease, the surrounding crowd of Eldenor and pikemen now look at you with fearful respect. You seize the opportunity to wheel your horse about, and then you spur him to the gallop and scatter a score of soldiers as you attempt an escape along the crowded west road. Soon the cry goes up from the city's battlements to stop you. And, when you are only a few hundred yards away from the gatehouse, your horse is brought crashing to the ground by a volley of arrows. A mass of angry Eldenorans close in and grab hold of you before you can get to your feet. Roughly, they bind your hands with cord. Then they confiscate your weapons, belt pouch, backpack, and cape. They took my cape?! They took my fucking cape?! Delete these from your action chart, motherfucker. You need not erase any special items, however, as none of these are taken. I'm just going to assume I can maybe get my stuff back. So I'm not going to delete anything yet. I'll just remember that all of this stuff is actually gone. But it doesn't matter. My special items are the stuff that's important. None of the Why would they not be taken, though? The summer sword. Ah, eh, we don't need that. <laughs> We're not going to take that. We're just going to take his bow and his axe, but not his shining super magical sword in its corlinium scabbard. I'm going to assume I use my Kai skills, like my Kai camouflage skills, to hide that so they don't detect it. And I let them take the more obvious items.
Minutes later, the staff-wielding center arrives with a horse-drawn cart, into which the soldiers bundle you unceremoniously. The robed druid cackles like a craved maniac, ecstatic at having identified and captured Lone Wolf, the destroyer of so many of his evil brethren. His vile laughter echoes in your ears as he lashes the horses and steers his rickety cart back to the gatehouse and into the dark streets of Duodon beyond. After a short and bruising journey at breakneck speed, you pass beneath the imposing arch of Skulltor, the fortified bastion of Duodon's long line of past rulers, and descend a stone ramp to an underground gale. Here you are greeted by a squad of brutal guards who beat you mercilessly with staves. Ow, lose three endurance. I would think you would lose more endurance than that from being beaten mercilessly with staves, but hey. Before imprisoning you in a circular pit infested with vermin. Oh. That's gross. I don't like vermin. The stench of the circular pit is almost unbearable. The floor is covered with a brackish green slime in which a host of flea infested rats was scratching for food. In the dim half-light, you watch with a mixture of fascination and revulsion as these vicious rats burrow nose-first into the evil-smelling mire, pausing only to fight when one of them uncovers the prey that they are hunting for, glistening, black-bodied worms. If they talked to Samra Sword and beat you with it, it would be, have been more, yeah, a lot more, I guess. Although the Samra Sword, it says, it loses its powers if it's wielded by anyone except for a Kai Lord. That's what it said when I first got it. Using your Magna Kai skill of Nexus, you are able to free your hands from the cords that bind them. Escape from this pit is now foremost in your mind. Beyond the wall, you can hear the sound of rushing water. And, when you move to where the sound is loudest, you discover a panel partially concealed by slime. A closer inspection reveals it to be an opening to a circular chute. You are working on a way to prize open this panel, hoping it will lead to a way out of the pit, when suddenly there is a grating rumble high above. A column of bright light invades the gloom, and, squealing with fright, the rats burrow frantically into the slime to avoid it. Well, well, if it isn't Grandmaster Lone Wolf himself, booms a man's voice from the top of the shaft. How good of you to come to Duodon in person. You have saved me the further expense of having you hunted down and brought here in chains. Quickly, your eyes grow accustomed to the light, and you see, peering over the lip of an open trapdoor at the top of the shaft, the sneering face of a young man. His pointed beard and mustache are trimmed to perfection, and his dark eyes twinkle with a cold malevolence that places a chill in your very soul. His skin is unusually pale, and, judging from the wealth of gold embellishment that bedecks the neck of his velvet tunic, you feel sure that he is Prince Lutha the self-appointed ruler of this city. So it's not Idris Elba, then. What do you intend for me? You ask aloud, but silently you are dreading his answer. The prince does not reply directly. He simply utters a soft, chilling laugh as he extends his right hand. On his index finger, you see a glowing ring of green crystal. And, in a moment of terror, you realize that it is an artifact of pure evil, fashioned by and imbued with the power of the dark god Nar himself. So it's like the Death Staff. Alright. Magi Magic, Assimilance, and Grand Guardian. Kai Alchemy, Somersword. Do I want to use the Samra Sword here, or do I want to use Assimilance and Grand Guardian? I think I'll just bust out the Samra Sword. Fuck this guy. Oh.
From the crystal ring, there pours forth a torrent of energy. A crackling vortex of evil power that whirls around and around the wall of the circular shaft as it slowly descends towards you. Tugging the summer sword from its scabbard, you hold the golden blade aloft and brace yourself for the moment the two powers collide. The tip of the swirling vortex is drawn to your blade like lightning to a conductor, and upon the instant it touches the tip, there is a blinding flash. An electrifying jolt runs through your body, and a deafening screech splits the air. For a terrifying moment, the tip of the summer sword becomes molten and begins to lose its rigidity. Then there is another flash, and the power of the ring rebounds from your divine blade and returns towards its source, conquered and repelled by the goodly might of the Sword of the Sun. For an instant, you glimpse the prince's face. It is a mask of abject terror. Then the vortex reaches him, and, in an instant, he is swallowed up by a whirlwind of supernatural fire. Did I just seriously fucking one-shot this guy with his own spell? Off the Somers word? Like, <laughs> did I, is he dead? Did I beat Lutha already? Because <laughs> that was kind of lol. So perish all who serve the Dark God, you scream, elated by your victory over the evil Prince Lutha. It couldn't really be that easy, right? He's going to come back in some way that wasn't even his final form or some shit. I don't know, maybe I just won. Summer sword for the win, literally. High above, you can hear the distant sound of running feet. A troop of the prince's guards is rushing to his aid, although you sense that it is too late to save him now. Rather than stay to face their wrath when they discover their leader has been incinerated, you use the summer sword to open the circular panel in the wall of the pit. As it falls away, you discover a chute which leads to an underground river. Quickly, you crawl along this slime-smeared chute and slip into the cold waters where you are carried swiftly away by the strong undercurrent. <laughs> Nox! <laughs> Maybe we should have taken that sword away, mutters the guardsman softly. <laughs> yeah, no shit, right? They left it on the like, ah, this looks harmless. <laughs> Take that axe he's got, though, and that bow. I'm sure this sword is just decorative. Alright. Maybe we should have taken that sword away. <laughs> For several minutes, you ride the river, keeping to the center of its course to avoid being dashed against the rough rock... the rough rock walls... the rough rock walls of the tunnel through which it flows. Then you glimpse a moonlit opening in the distance, and a few minimum... A Wow, having problems. I've reached that point in the book, haven't I? When I stop being able to talk. Then you glimpse a moonlit opening in the distance, and a few moments later, you are tumbling from an outflow at the base of Duodon's east city wall. You fall amidst a torrent of frothing water and hit the surface of a river 20 feet below. Immediately, you strike out with your hands and rise as quickly as you can, spitting out a mouthful of foul-tasting water as soon as your head breaks the surface. The current pushes you towards the riverbank, where a group of beggars clad in moldering rags are sifting through the flotsam that is being flushed out of the city. You note with disgust that this floating debris consists mainly of corpses, many the victims of Prince Lutha's brutal regime. The beggars take fright and scatter when you stagger out of the water. You watch them run away. Then you hurry towards the beckoning safety of a wood which borders upon a rutted river road. Here you spend a damp, uncomfortable night, trying to formulate a new plan of action that will enable you to reach Cassiorn as quickly as possible. At length you resolve to go east and attempt to cross the river Storm to the Salonese city of Rem, located on its east bank. It has the reputation for being a tough and lawless place, but you feel sure it can be no worse than Duodon. But first, I go back into Duodon and get my shit. Because I, they took my shit, and I don't want to lose my shit. I hate when I lose my shit. Every so often, they just make you lose all your shit, and it makes me sad. Oh my god! I'm gonna lose the blanket! I, oh no! The blanket! All this time I've kept that blanket ever since I lost the towel! 
The blanket was the replacement. I've had the blanket. I'm gonna lose the blanket. And the talisman of Ashir, the flask of Aquas. Mathos potion. I'm gonna lose the blanket. I have a feeling I'm not getting this stuff back. Because I'm, like, leaving the city now. Completely. Lost my bow, too. I mean, I can always get another bow, but... Lost my blanket. Those bastards. You are woken from a fitful slumber by the sound of shouting. Cautiously, you part the foliage to see a group of Duodon guardsmen scouring the riverbank in search of your body. A brutish garrison sergeant is questioning a scrawny beggar whom he holds by the neck, lifting him several inches off the ground. The beggar, shaking with fear, points a finger towards the wood. The sergeant gives him a sneering smile and then rewards him for his cooperation with a dagger in the guts. Oh, this guy's an asshole. Lone Wolf has to visit that noble lady to get a towel and blanket. Yeah, exactly. Well, just a towel would be fine. Towel's ideal. If you can't have a towel, then I'll take a blanket. Both would just be indulgent. Switch the corpse! Switch the corpse! Bellows the sergeant, wiping the blood from his blade on the dead beggar's coat. Damn Northlanders going to ground in there! Quickly, you retreat deeper into the wood as a line of soldiers comes crashing through the foliage, hacking and slashing with their broad-bladed swords. Using your camouflage skills, you slip through their line and make your way back towards the river road to the place where they have left their horses. A blow to the base of the skull puts paid- Oh, it's back! It's back! It returns finally all these books later. He returns to the phrase, puts paid. He got a new editor, the, the one editor that wouldn't allow him to use it anymore is gone, and so now he knows he can slip it in there and get away with it again. Puts paid! A blow to the base of the skull puts paid to the soldier who was standing guard there. And, as quietly as you can, you take a horse and escape towards the east. Okay, uh, yeah, this is good times. Good times. I'm about to have super keen senses and a chill. Joe Deaver put paid to the old editor. When you can no longer see the walls of Duodon, you rein in your horse and take stock of the equipment contained in its saddlebags. You discover the following items. Record these items on your action chart. They replace those that were confiscated from you in Duodon. No! No, they don't. They do not replace the ones taken from me. They don't begin to replace what was taken from me. Alright, we're gonna have to delete all this shit, for real. We actually lost all this. The blanket, gone. The bowstring, the coil of oiled rope, the potion of Lomsburg, gone. Tinderbox, talisman of Ishir, gone. Flask of Aquas, Mathos potion, gone. Bow, gone. Axe, gone. And what do we have here? A backpack, a rope, enough food for two meals, a sword, three gold crowns, Oh, they took my fucking money, too! They took my belt pouch, it said, also. Three gold crowns, a bow, and a quiver containing three arrows. Well, a quiver's a special item, so I never lost my quiver. Technically. I'll say they took my quiver, though, and I, and I have to replace it with these new arrows. My crowns are gone. My loon is gone, my Kika are gone. See, I'm gonna be glad I have all those crowns at the monastery. I'm gonna get back there and it's gonna be like, the monastery's been sacked and also you find that any gold or items you were storing at the monastery are also gone. <laughs> Alright, so I have three crowns. I have a rope. Meal, meal, rope, I have a bow, and I have, I'm gonna take this sword, even though I have the Somers sword, just so I have a backup weapon in case, for some reason.
I literally took all this stuff. Determinedly, you can t and I lost the cape. The cool whooshing cape is gone already. Determinedly, you continue your ride east, and by mid-afternoon, you come to the banks of the mighty river Storm. From the cover of a derelict barn, you observe a group of merchants and travelers who are waiting at a ferry post for the boat to rem. The post is controlled by Eldenoran soldiers who check the ferry passengers thoroughly to make sure they are not enemy agents or deserters from the army. After an hour or so, you see the boat from Rem approaching the post. The waiting crowd gather their belongings and get ready to board what would be the last crossing of the day. Do I want to try to go to the ferry post and board the boat, even though there's soldiers checking? Or avoid the ferry and try to swim across the river? Oh, both of those sound terrible. Both of those are not a good idea. Fuck it, I can kill those soldiers, right? I'm gonna go to the ferry post and try to board the boat. You leave your horse at the derelict barn and make your way on foot towards the ferry post, arriving there just as the boat is docking at the jetty. Using your Kai camouflage skills and aided by the frenzy of activity, you merge with the crowds of anxious travelers who are jostling to get aboard. An impatient trio of Eldenoran soldiers are collecting tickets from passengers before allowing them off the jetty. When it is your turn to board, you say that you have dropped your ticket and lost it. Buy again! shouts one of the soldiers. Yeah! sneers another. Cough up another two crowns, you scab, and be sharpish about it. Hurriedly, you give the soldier two crowns and take your place aboard the crowded boat. So now instead of having three crowns, I have one. Lovely. Okay. 77, lucky number. Feeling it, I'm feeling it. You avoid, as best you can, any contact with your fellow passengers as the ferry sets off on its return trip to the city of Rem. It docks inside the city's famous horseshoe-shaped harbor, and you make sure that you are among the first to disembark. Using your Kai camouflage skills and your natural stealth, you avoid the attentions of the watchful Salonese guards at the harbor, and once inside the city proper, you merge with the crowds. Soon you find yourself in a square that is overshadowed by the twin towers of Rem Cathedral. An avenue runs along the cathedral's south side, and at its far end your eye is drawn to a rusty suit of armor which stands beside the door to a dingy looking weapons shop. Of course I'm going to enter this armory. Although I don't have any money to buy anything, which is unfortunate. I've had all this money that I've carried around book after book after book and never had anything to buy with it. Now when I'm finally out of money... All kinds of shops pop up. But I'm going to go in there anyway. Son of a bitch. Stuff I've been wanting, too. The owner of this emporium is a grizzled old veteran of many wars. As you enter, you see him and his son busy at a workbench, shaping and flattening squares of rusty iron into poor quality breastplates. A sign fixed to their bench reads, see, it doesn't say. Swords, they sell, they buy for two gold, sell for four. Spears, three and six. Axes, one and two. Daggers, one and two. Bows, three and six. Arrows, one half gold crown. And sell for one. Broadswords, three and six. Maces, one and two. Helmets, three and six. Breastplates, three and six. Foo suits of armor by special arrangement. If you wish to purchase or sell any of the above weapons for gold crowns, remember to make the necessary adjustments to your action chart. According to the game rules section of Flight from the Dark, a helmet adds two endurance points to your total. Additionally, the game rules the chainmail weight code adds four points. Right. Yeah, it made me lose. I lost all my armor when I came over into the Grandmaster series. 
I ha used to have a helmet, and I used to have armor, and they've been gone, and I haven't gotten any back this whole time. The whole time I've been in the Grand Master books. Now I have an option to actually get some, and I don't have any fucking money. Hmm... I was just thinking that I could sell all these I could sell these weapons. I can always get another bow. And I don't really need the sword. I have the summer sword. I have one crown. If I sold the sword, I would have three crowns. I would have to sell the bow as well to get a helmet or a breastplate. Fuck it. Let's do it. Selling this bow and this sword and two of these arrows it gives me six crowns so I have seven I'm gonna buy a breastplate giving me one crown I know that armor counts as a special item plus four endurance which gives me a nice 60 endurance now. I'm feeling that. I technically don't have any money, any weapons now, except for my Somersword, Sword, but I can replace those easily. You continue along the avenue until you reach the city's north wall. Here you stop to read a proclamation that has been nailed to the door of a coaching inn and stables. It states that a curfew is in force in Rem, and anyone found on the streets an hour after nightfall will be arrested by the city watch. You are about to leave when you overhear the owner of the stables talking to one of his stable hands. The boy is holding the reins of an aged horse that is severely lame in one leg, and the owner is telling him that he can no longer afford to stable the sick old mare. Shall have to go, says the owner, shaking his head. She is worthless to me now. She's not earning her keep. Tears are streaming down the young boy's face. Clearly, he loves the old horse and is heartbroken at the prospect of her being destroyed. Boldly, you approach the owner and propose a deal. Sir, if I am able to cure this lame mare, you say, stroking the horse's velvety nose, then will you allow me to keep her? Ha ha ha! So you think you can work miracles, do ya? chuckles the owner. Very well, stranger. If you can cure her, you can keep her. Gently, you settle the mare and run your hands down her lame foreleg. Using your magnakai disciplines of curing and animal control, you slowly ease her worn-out joints and mend her cracked bones. Within minutes, she is as agile as a newborn foal. Well, I be a storg's uncle, gasps the owner, amazed by the sudden transformation. So, stranger, you can work miracles after all. The horse is yours. You climb upon the mare's back and wave farewell to the owner and the stable boy, who is now crying tears of joy. If ever you're looking for work, says the owner as you turn the horse to leave, and there'll always be a job for you here. Yeah, I'm gonna stay here and use my magical healing powers as a part of a job working for some stable owner. That's, that's the best thing I have going in my life. All right, so we got another horse, finally. Even more healing. This is way more healing 
And the lone wolf is ever used in any form or any previous book. Yeah, right? I'll heal another one of your horses if you'll give me six crowns so I can go get a helmet. For real. I really want a shield again, too. I used to have a shield and it adds to your combat skill. And I've never found another shield since it, they took away my, my shield. You ride out of Rem by its east gate and head off along a wide road that is bordered by hovels and farmsteads. Shortly, you come to a signpost where the road ends and a track begins. It marks the entrance to the forest of Salony and indicates the distances to two Salonese towns. Elio, 50 miles. Amory, 100 miles. All right, I know I, I, know I shouldn't go to Amory because the Lord of Amory hates me and wants me to die. And the last time I tried to go to Amory, I had an instant death just from going to Amory. I have not forgotten. I have not forgotten Amory from fucking book six. I will absolutely not go there. You follow the track deep into the forest and spend your first night in Salony here, surrounded by the leafy comfort of this rich timberland. At dawn, you resume your ride, and by nightfall, you find yourself approaching the outskirts of the forest town of Elio. There's a person riding a horse. During your long day's ride through the forest, unless you possess Grand Hunt Mastery, you must eat a meal or lose three endurance points. I do have Grand Hunt Mastery, so whatevs. No problem. The first spatterings of rain. Ah, uh, I'm bespattered. The first spatterings of rain are dampening your shoulders as you approach the forest town's solitary inn. The smell and soft noises of horses waft from an adjoining stable, and the flickering orange light of an open fire can be seen shimmering through the bullseye glass of the inn's leaded windows. You halt outside the main door and stoop to read a weather-faded board that is fixed to the wall. The Towering Pine Inn. Room and stabling, two gold crowns per night. Oh shit. I don't have two gold crowns. <laughs> I only have one. Nox says it's so odd that you find all these lords and captains, captains and soldier regiments, but none of them have spare armor for you. Right? Can I get some armor? Damn. I don't have sufficient gold crowns. I guess I'm sleeping in the fucking gutter. Been there, done that. Find a fucking nice recessed doorway. Sleep in the, sleep in the doorway. You spend a cold and uncomfortable night sheltering beneath a stone bridge near the center of this forest town. Hey, sleeping under a bridge isn't bad. It's good shelter, a bridge. Use two endurance points. The rain, which began at dusk, eases off at dawn. In the gray half-light, you gather some nutritious roots and grasses for your mare, and allow her to finish them before setting off on the trail which heads east out of Elio. Elio? Start healing myself. For two days, you follow this trail through the great forest of Salony. During your ride, it strikes you that the weather seems to be reflecting the nature of the people who dwell in this region, cold and inhospitable. They do not take kindly to strangers, especially those riding alone. On the morning of the third day, you reach a small village called Hopforst, which stands at the edge of the great forest. To the west of the village, you can now see the snow-capped mountain peaks of the Senners, and to the north stretches an open expanse of rough grassland dotted with thickens of larch and pine. <laughs> Nox, you tell the innkeeper that you're Lone Wolf, Slayer of the Dark Lords, and tons of other stuff, and say that he better have a room for you. I know, right? I show him, like, all of my special medals and badges and insignias and shit that I've got. As dusk is drawing its curtain of shadow over the land, you see in the distance the decaying walls of a derelict city. A broken sign by the roadside says that this place is called Amory. 
Yet the newest track, which branches off the road and avoids the city gate, tells you that travelers on this road no longer visit there. Visit here. It's a bad place. I don't want to go to Amory. The, the Lord guy, Rourke, the lord of this place, is a total fucking asshole. It has begun to rain again, and you are quietly dreading having to spend another night out in the open. Tempted by the promise of shelter, you approach Amory and enter the city by a gate that hangs haphazardly from its hinges. Watch. I'm gonna get to the next section and it's gonna be all like, Have you ever uh, uh, met somebody named Rourke in a previous book? Or have you ever been to the Amory in a previous book? Or whatever. It's gonna make some reference to book six. And I'm gonna have to be like, yes, and bad shit's gonna happen. At close quarters, the city of Amory gives off an odor of disease and decay. Its flagstoned streets are cracked and broken open by plants. The roofs of its once fine houses have long since caved in, and every surface is damp and mildewed. It is also completely deserted. Even the rats have left. Hold on, I just want to check the map again really fast. See, how far have we come? Alright, we were in... We were in... Nersha, Oridal, we went to Oridal, we were down here, we went to Oridal, we, we went through Nersha, Abisko, we went through Duanon, we went through Rem, now we're up here at Amory. Alright, we've covered a lot of distance towards Cassiorn from where we were. We're doing okay, Elio, Amory. You seek shelter in one of the few buildings with a roof still intact. The furnishings that you discover here are made of the finest Duranese oak and Salonese leather, but none withstand your weight. Everything has rotted and falls to shreds at a touch. You are clearing debris from the floor to make a place to sleep, when suddenly you hear hoofbeats in the street outside. You rush to the open door and see, to your shocked surprise, a ghostly rider astride a black horse come galloping down the narrow avenue. Tongues of red flame shoot from the horse's nostrils, and it leaves in its wake a trail of green mist. Holy shit. So we have a- we have fucking ghost rider up in here. Fire coming out of the nostrils. His mouth opens really fucking wide for some reason. This guy looks like Rourke. Is this the ghost of Rourke? Uh, I have visited the town of Quarlin. It is the ghost of Rourke! Told you this guy was gonna act up with us. A cold lance of fear stabs your heart the moment you see the face of the ghostly rider. You recognize it immediately to be Rourke, the highborn lordling of Amory who chose to follow the ways of evil. Rourke was once a powerful disciple of the demon lord Tagazin, and a secret practitioner of the foul arts of the center druids, but he has long since perished in the flesh. See, I didn't know all that. I just thought he was an asshole. Yet his evil spirit lives on, tortured and restless, doomed to ride the deserted streets of his shattered city as the ghastly specter of Rourke comes rushing towards you on his hellish steed. His mouth opens and a hideous shriek fills the air. You feel a pressure rapidly building in your head, an agonizing force that threatens to tear your skull apart. Yes, I have Kai screen. Of course I do. What am I, some noob? I'm a Grand Thane. I check Thane life. I already made that joke. Just like, yeah, I know I did, and I made it again. You know? And I'll do it again, too. This isn't the last time, so just wait for it. So, yeah. I just had a little argument with myself. Oh, somebody actually knows how to fight! You erect a psychic shield to protect your mind from Rourke's assault, and you successfully deflect his attack. But as his ghastly apparition gallops past, it stirs in its wake a whirling maelstrom that is filled with rocks, broken glass, and other city debris. This whirlwind assails you physically and knocks you to the ground. I have to fight the Ghost of Rourke. You conduct this combat in the normal way. While attacking the Ghost of Rourke using your Psychic Kai abilities, you must defend yourself 
from the injurious effects of the debris storm. Only by defeating Rourke's ghost in combat will you cause the maelstrom to cease. So I can use my psychic abilities on him. So his combat skill is 48, but I'm going to use Mind Blast on him, which will bring it down to 44. This shouldn't be any problem. 60 versus 30. Go. Yes, I, t I lost none. He lost 12. Let's go again. 60 versus 18. Yes, I lost none. I killed Rourke's ass without even getting scratched. Without even getting scratched. For you, Rourke, in Rourke's book that he's reading, he has a thing saying, you try to fight Lone Wolf and he fucking schools your ass. Your life, your unlife and your ghostly mission end here. And then he has to listen to The Price is Right Losing Horn. Yeah, Rourke. That was a, a flawless victory. Upon the instant you defeat the spirit of Rourke, the whirlwind ceases and all the airborne debris drops harmlessly to the ground. Rourke's ghostly apparition mouths a silent scream before it and its hideous mount melt into the shadows of the night. You sense that the evil which pervaded this sad city has at last been banished for good. You sleep easily this night, and you awake the following morning to the sound of birdsong. It brings a smile to your face to hear that life is already returning to Amory. You gather your equipment, and as you are leaving, you are blessed by an unexpected stroke of luck. By accident, you step on a rotten board, and when you pull your foot free, you discover ten crowns hidden in the hollow beneath the four floorboards. Damn! Now I get some money! I run back and buy that helmet. Now I have 11. Now I'm rich. You're right though, this book is all about money. There's so much money that's changed hands in this book. Once outside the broken gate of Amory, you turn to the north and follow the road which leads to Veretta, the principal city of Lyris. At noon, you come to a fork in the road where a signpost indicates two different destinations, Sorin, left, and Veretta, right. You take the right-hand road and spend the afternoon riding across a lonely stretch of gently undulating plain. During this ride, unless you possess Grand Hunt Mastery, you must eat a meal or lose three endurance points. Daylight is beginning to wane when you arrive at a village that is dominated by a fortified manor house. Rain clouds are fast closing in from the west, and your thoughts turn once more to finding shelter for the night. Uh, village or manor house? Well, the last time I went to a manor house or that dude's castle, shit was really bad. I'd rather go to the village, I think. The manor house sounds like a place of problems. I think we're going to the manor house. No, the village, I mean. I think we're going to the village. This village is a run-down, shabby-looking place, which appears to have seen better days. The timbers of its gaudily painted houses are riddled with rot, and its citizens have a mean and surly demeanor that you find irksome. You are having second thoughts about stopping at the inn, and are only persuaded when you hear the distant rumble of thunder. To your surprise, you discover the owner of the Pickled Scow. It's a great name for an inn. To be an unusually kind and cheerful character. For three gold crowns... Three gold crowns... He and his daughter furnish you with a fine meal and a warm room above their kitchen. Before you retire for the night, they invite you to sample their ale, free of charge. It is a weak but flavorsome brew, and while you sip it in front of the blazing hearth, they tell you stories about the colorful travelers who have spent the night at their inn. I think I'm the most colorful traveler they've ever had in their inn. Nobody, nobody they've ever had here has stories like fucking Lone Wolf has stories.
I'm gonna ask them if they have any news about Summerland. Yeah, I'm gonna ask them. I trust these people. Summerland? Answers the innkeeper quizzically. I'm afraid not, kind sir. Your home must be more than 600 miles from here. It's rare we get to hear what's going on in Veretta, and that's only 25 miles to north. Hearing the innkeeper mention how far it is to Summerland brings a leaden feeling to your stomach. You still have far to go, and so little time in which to accomplish your urgent journey. Feeling chastened by the daunting number of miles you must ride, you bid the innkeeper and his daughter good night and retire quietly to your room. Yeah, we still have a long fucking way to go. You sleep well and rise with the cock's crow. When you reach the stable, you discover the innkeeper has already prepared your horse, ready for your departure. You thank him and wave farewell to the cheerful man and his daughter as you set off on the road north to Veretta. It is midday when you catch your first glimpse of this ancient city. Positioned on a large plateau in the center of a grassy plain, the blood-red walls and towering spires of Veretta look doubly impressive. As you approach the south gate, you admire the carvings which embellish the city's walls. They depict great dragons with snake-like bodies that intertwine as they flow around the towers and bastions of this ancient city. I remember this city. We've definitely been to Veretta. That was in Book 6. We, this is where we got the very first lore stone. The lore stone of Veretta. The guards at the gate allow you to enter without challenge, and you pass through the grand southern entrance which leads to a flagstoned square. I have definitely been to Veretta. As you stop to survey the shops and stalls which encircle this busy square, you recall the welcome help you received from Gwynian the Sage the last time you visited here. You remember vividly your meeting with him at the Halls of Learning, but you have no idea whereabouts in this vast city the halls are located. What? I've been to the Halls of Learning. Well, yeah, just because I've been there doesn't mean I know how to get there again, I guess. Yeah, I'm gonna go find Gwynian. Yeah. Gwynian's cool. You ask a street trader the way to the Halls of Learning, and he points impatiently to an avenue on the west side of the square. A rusty plate fixed to the corner building says Quill Street. It's- Oh, we have a talking rusty plate! See, sometimes he says says, sometimes he says reads, but... I think when it says says, you know, you can logically assume that the rusty plate is actually talking. Just saying. You ride along this narrow avenue, just flanked by aromatic jala houses and perfumeries, until it turns abruptly right into a wider thoroughfare called Brass Street. A smile cracks your travel grimy face when you see the courtyard entrance to a grand building. It has changed much since you were last here, but despite its new brick and marble facade, you recognize Veretta's Halls of Learning. You ride along a graveled path to a fountain where you stop to ask a brown-robed scholar if he knows where Gwynian can be found. Without speaking, he points to a nearby hall. A sign hanging over its richly carved oak door says, Library! Thanks, sign. You thank the robed man and the sign and dismount from your horse, leaving him tied to a ring which is set into the wall. Then you push open the door and enter the library's cool interior. Countless thousands of books and parchments crowd the stone shelves of this magnificent library. Your eyes travel along them until they reach another door at the far end of the hall. There, standing framed in the arch, is the man whose help you seek. Welcome, Grandmaster, says Gwynian the Sage. I've been expecting you. Good to see you again, Gwynian. Gwynian ushers you through into an adjoining chamber where floating bulbs of light illuminate a stone table covered with charts and scrolls. What news have you of Summerland? You ask anxiously. Grave news, replies Gwynian with an ominous tone. He picks up a chart from the table and traces a finger across the intricate lines and calculations that embellish its ancient yellowed surface. 
The Dark God Nar has opened a shadow gate in the Dern Crag Mountains, a corridor between our world and his. By means of this corridor, he has sent a host of winged creatures, the Lavas, to assail your monastery. Yeah, we fought some of those Lavas when we were in the Shadow Realm. It is his plan to destroy the young order of Kai warriors while you are not able to lead them. The Shadow Gate opened at the time of the last full moon, and since then the Kai Monastery has been attacked many times. Nar's servants have your stronghold encircled and cut off from the armies of King Olnar, who has repeatedly sought to break the siege. Your Kai have withstood the attacks well, Lone Wolf, but they are weakening. Only you can save them now. But how, you ask, shaken by Gwynion's account of the events which have occurred during your absence from the monastery. If the armies of King Olnar are powerless to break the siege, how can I hope to save my brethren? Do not despair, Lone Wolf, replies Gwynion reassuringly. All is not yet lost. You can save your brave order by closing the gate through which Nar sends his Lavas minions. You were about to ask how you could possibly achieve this, how you could close the Shadow Gate, but your urgent question is forestalled when Gwynion raises his hand. Patience for just a moment, Lone Wolf, he says, and he allows himself a smile. I, humble Gwynion, possess the means by which you can thwart the Dark God's murderous plan. Well, it's really fucking convenient that I came here then. What if I'd just been like, nah, I don't want to see Gwynion. Then you get there and it's like, sorry, you've got no way to close the Shadow Gate. I guess you're fucked. <laughs> no, I'm sure it doesn't work out that way, but still, it seems convenient. From a secret drawer beneath the stone table, Gwynion brings forth a golden crystal the size of an apple. Its multifaceted surface radiates a myriad tiny beams with shimmer and sparkle with the fiery energy that is locked within its core. This is a sun crystal, Grandmaster, he says, placing the object into the palm of your hand. Its surface feels pleasantly warm, inviting your touch. If you're to save your brethren, you must close the Shadow Gate for good. This crystal can achieve this aim. It contains power sufficient to destroy the Shadow Gate and prevent its return. Well, that's convenient, too. Just happened to have the sun crystal right here. Here's a picture of Gwydion and his sun crystal. So basically it looks like a, a disco ball. Okay. You look down at the glowing crystal with fearful respect. Gwydion notes your concern and smiles. You need not fear the crystal's power, for it cannot cause harm in our world. Only if it is cast into another plane of existence will its powers be released. Grandmaster, you must cast it into the Shadow Gate that Nar has created. So this is how I can save my brethren, you whisper as you peer into the glittering head of the crystal. Just so, replies Gwynion. Just so. Then I must away at once, you say, placing the sun crystal into the pocket of your tunic. Now that I have the weapon I need to save my people, I can stay not a moment longer. I must leave for Cassiorn at once. Yes, says Gwynion, still smiling. I know of your plans, and I have made provision for you to travel to the city of merchants more swiftly. Come, follow me, and all will be revealed. Man, it was a good idea to come see him. Record the sun crystal on your action chart as a special item. You must discard another item in its favor if you already possess the maximum number permissible. I don't. Sun crystal. That's definitely getting a TM. Thanks, Gwynion. You're alright, man. You're alright. You follow Gwynion through a series of corridors to a stable from where he brings forth a magnificent white stallion, the finest steed you have ever seen. This is wild wind, Grandmaster, says Gwynion as he strokes the steed's muscular neck. He will carry you to Cassiorn far swifter than any horse you have known. Swifter than even your own fine steed, Storm. You look into Wild Wind's intelligent eyes and you, you detect the faint aura of magic about him. 
but it is not until you climb into the saddle that you sense his true power. A thousand thanks, Gwynion. I am forever in your debt. We've seen that illustration before. And with these words, you bid Gwynion farewell and leave the halls of learning. You depart from Veretta through its great east gate, and once outside the city, you spur Wild Wind to the gallop. You are astounded by his speed and untiring stamina. Gwynion was right. He is the fastest horse you have ever ridden. Okay, Noxmoo, have a good night. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for chatting. As usual, good times. I'll see you next time. Sleep well. In little more than an hour, you have covered 60 miles. Wait, this fucking horse gallops at 60 miles an hour? That's ludicrously fast for a fucking animal. <laughs> Like, you know how fast his legs would have to be moving to gallop 60 miles an hour? It is only when you find yourself approaching a stone bridge commanded by a huge gated archway that you are forced to rein him to a halt. Above the archway, you notice the words Denka Gate engraved into the stone. Below them, written in chalk, is the message Toll, Four Gold Crowns. After a few minutes, an unshaven old man emerges from a door set into this grand gate. He holds out his hand and demands that you pay him the toll. Well, I, I'm gonna pay him. I don't care. I don't care. There you go. You leave behind the Denka Gate and follow a road that twists and climbs through densely wooded highland. Once you crest the last timbered hill, you begin a gradual descent towards the Tonor Valley a fertile expanse of cropland and grassy plain. By dusk, you can see the river Quarrel ahead, and shortly before nightfall, you cross its fast-flowing waters at a bridge in the center of Quarlan, a busy town on the caravan route to Cassiorn. Quarlan is... We've been here before. We've been to Quarlan. This is where we met the old man, the old wizard guy that we were with that got killed on the way. And this is where we first met Rourke and shot him with an arrow and right outside Quarlin is where we lost the archery contest sadly just beyond the bridge you see an impressive hostelry with adjoining stables a shield hangs above the courtyard gate displaying its name the Barrel Bridge Tavern we might have been to this exact place actually I don't remember um I'll stop and enter the hostelry As you enter the courtyard, a boy rushes out of the stables and eagerly takes charge of Wild Wind's reins. He praises your horse enthusiastically and promises that he will look after him well while you are enjoying your visit to the tavern. On entering the taproom, you are welcomed by the mouth-watering smell of roasting beef and fine ale. The tavern is busy, and nobody pays you any special attention as you take a seat by the counter. At a nearby table, you notice an argument is brewing between a merchant and a man dressed in a shabby hide coat. The merchant is accusing the man of stealing a purse of gems from his pocket, and the confrontation is being made worse by a third man, a lank-haired lank bargee, who is siding with the merchant. The accused man pleads that he is innocent, but the other two give no credence to his pleas. Suddenly, the merchant draws a dagger and threatens to slit the man's throat unless he hands over the stolen gems at once. I have Telenosis, and I've achieved Grand Thane. So, let's, uh, six cents some shit here. Your advanced Kai Mastery reveals to you the whereabouts of the missing purse of gems. It is in the boot of the Bargy, the lank-haired man who is siding with the merchant against the other. He is hoping to keep hidden his guilt by pointing the finger of suspicion at the man in the hide coat. The Bargy steps away from the table, and as he tries to move quietly towards the tavern door, he passes in front of your chair. Deftly, you kick the top of his boot. The blow spit, splits the purse and scatters gemstones all over the tavern floor. Why you? growls the guilty bargy, and in the blink of an eye, he draws a dagger and lunges for your heart. <laughs> this guy's about to have a bad day. Yeah, he looks like an asshole. 
He's coming at me with a dagger, seriously. You just brought a dagger to a Somers word fight. Master thief. Not that much of a master thief, obviously. If you can just kick his boot and the loot comes out. Alright, let's school this guy real quick. I'm not even going to bother with psychic attacks. Don't need to. 60 and 25, round one. One shot at him. Boom! This fucking head took his head clean off. The accused man thanks you profusely for proving his innocence. And the merchant, while on his hands and knees gathering up his scattered gems, offers the man one of his glittering stones by way of an apology. Red-faced with embarrassment, the merchant then offers you ten gold crowns for having rid him of a thief whom he was about to entrust with his entire cargo of gems and spices from Cassiorn. I'll take the ten crowns. The tavern owner, however, is not so understanding. He does not like blood being spilled on his premises, and he asks you to leave at once. You bid all three good night, and then return to the stables to collect wild wind. A signpost on the road out of Corland says, reads, says, Cassiorn, 260 miles! On a normal horse, you would expect the journey to take four days, but on Wild Wind, you are confident of reaching the City of Merchants before midnight. Yeah, if he can go 60 miles an hour, that's a little over four hours is all it's going to take. Aided by a full moon and your sharp Kai skills, you keep Wild Wind on a safe course throughout your long night's ride. Rapidly, the miles melt away beneath his hooves, and, as midnight approaches, you see the welcoming lights of Cassiorn twinkling on the horizon. Using magical spy glasses, the watchful guards above the city's west gate see you coming, and set their torches to fire beacons to help guide you. The gates of the city are thrown open, and, as you ride through, you meet with a thunderous welcome from its citizens, rich and poor, many of whom have left their beds to cheer your arrival. Oh, I guess they knew I was coming. Wow. My mission is apparently not super secret. Not until you see the bulbous golden towers of the High Mayor's Palace do you allow Wild Wind to slow his pace. You pass through the palace's grand arch, crafted from marble and gold, and as you bring Wild Wind to a halt, you see a wondrous skyship hovering over the roof of the High Mayor's chambers. It reminds you of Skyrider, your friend Guildmaster Bainden's flying ship, Although the craft above is sleeker and appears to be fashioned not from wood, but from burnished metal. Oh, that sounds badass. It's like a spaceship. She awaits your command, says Higher, High Mayor Cordis as he strides down the steps of his palace chambers with an entourage of guards and advisors scurrying in his wake. What do you think? He beams, pointing to the ship. Is she not magnificent? Here, there's sky. There's the ship up there. Towers. This must be the the mayor guy coming down. And his entourage. Yes, indeed she is. You reply as you dismount from Wild Wind, who, to your greater astonishment, displays not the slightest sign of fatigue after your incredible ride from Veretta. Pray tell me, High Mayor, what is the craft's name? We call her Cloud Dancer. He replies proudly. Within the hour, you are standing aboard the gleaming steel deck of Cloud Dancer, which vibrates gently in tune to the rising power of its magical engines. The crew of Cassiorn and Engineers set free the hawsers which hold her in place, and then, with a farewell wave to Cordus and his court, you give the order for Cloud Dancer to commence her maiden voyage north to Homeguard. Sweet. I got me a flying ship. I got me a flying ship. Can I take Windrider with me? Or Wild Wind with me on the ship? Because he's a badass horse. I need to keep him too. Throughout your sky voyage home, your mind is filled with the fear and uncertainty of what may await you in home guard. You spend most of the journey on the rear deck, alone with your thoughts, staring down at the land speeding past more than a mile below. You watch as the jungle of the Machenmeyer Swamp gives way to the barren scrub of the Wildlands. 
Then, when you catch sight of the Pass of Moitura, your pulse races with excitement, for this V-shaped cleft in the southern Durncrags is where the Wildland Territories end and your beloved homeland of Summerland begins. Yet the excitement you feel here is but nothing compared to your elation when you first glimpse the lights of Holmgard, the Somlending capital. Guided by beacons blazing atop the King's Citadel, the crew of the Cloud Dancer bring her gently in towards the city. The craft is made to hover directly above the Citadel, and hawsers are lowered to anchor her in position against the wind. Then you descend by rope ladder to the Citadel's roof, where you are greeted by a distinguished party of barons and friarls, led by King Olnar himself. Welcome home, Grandmaster, he says, his voice breaking with emotion. Then he clasps you to his chest like a father welcoming home a lost son. Thank Kai and Ashir you are safe, Lone Wolf, he says. Now may the darkness of Nar be lifted from our land. Yeah. Good to see you too, King Yu. King Olnar convenes an emergency council of the Somlending Barons in his chamber of state. When all are assembled, Baron Kaldar of Anskaven conducts a briefing, principally for your benefit, outlining the grave situation confronting Somerlin, and, most especially, the new order of the Kai. You are aware of much of what he says, having been briefed already by Gwynny and the Sage in Veretta, but you learn that the Somlending army has lost many brave men attempting to break the siege at the Kai Monastery, and is too weakened at present to attack the enemy again. Where is Guildmaster Bainden, you ask, when called upon by the king to speak to the Council of War? He is at the Kai Monastery, answers Baron Medar of Taiso. He, in company with Lord Ramoa of Desi and the ten most senior magicians of Torin's Brotherhood, went to the monastery during the early days of the siege. They traveled there aboard the Guildmaster's skyship and... At this point, the Baron hesitates and looks to the king, as if seeking his permission to continue. The king continues on his behalf. Grandmaster, he says, his voice heavy, the Guildmaster's skyship was seen falling from the skies above the monastery. Border rangers saw it crash in flames. We... we fear that all aboard were lost. No. Not Bainden. The king's words come as a terrible blow, for Bainden and Ramoa are your closest friends. If it is true, and all of Somerlin's finest magicians have been lost at a stroke, then the blow is doubly severe. The security of your homeland will have been greatly compromised by their deaths. I do have Telenosis, which I will use sadly as I turn to 252. You request the king to excuse you from the Council of War for a few moments. Lone Wolf's got to go have a good cry. He grants your request, thinking that you wish to be alone to grieve the loss of your friends, Bainden and Ramoa, and he allows you the use of his royal chamber. Once you are alone, you use your Kai Mastery to attempt to make contact with Guildmaster Bainden telepathically. You concentrate with all your power, straining your psychic energies in your effort to connect with your friend's mind. To your surprise, you detect a barrier in the ethereal plane, a wall of dark energy that has been placed there purposefully to prevent telepathic contact. You sense that the barrier is the work of the dark god Nar, and you call on all your reserves of psychic strength in an effort to break through it. Alright, pick a number for every level of Kai rank you've attained above Kai Grand Guardian, add one to the number you've picked. That's uh, one, two, three, four. Get to add four. So let's roll a four or higher, please. Yes, I rolled an eight. Awesome. You feel your psychic powers burrowing through Nar's ethereal barrier. You have almost penetrated this shield when suddenly you sense the presence of the Dark God himself. 
He is pouring the essence of his evil into the breach, repairing the damage you have inflicted. Immediately you sense your telenosis. You are mortally afraid of allowing Nar the opportunity of locating and attacking your mind force. For if he were to do so, you risk losing not only your sanity, but also your soul. Yeah, that sounds bad. Let's avoid that. Despite not having made a telepathic contact with Guildmaster Bandem, you refuse to believe that he and Lord Ramoa are dead. You resolve instead to reach the Kai Monastery and destroy the Shadow Gate as soon as you are able. And, strengthened by this resolution, you return to the Council of War and announce your decision to the King. You show the Council the Sun Crystal that Gwynion gave you, and you tell them how you intend to use it. Ulnar and the Barons applaud your plan and your steadfast courage. The King places under your command his Elite Guard Cavalry Regiment, so that you may be able to use them to break through the enemy's line at its weakest point and reach the Kai Monastery. Captain Duvall, Commander of the Guard Cavalry, knows where this weak point is and he will guide you to it. I remember Captain Duvall. From like the first or second book. The King dissolves the Council, and as the Barons return to their armies in the field, he orders you to rest in his chambers for a few hours. Get some sleep, Grandmaster, he says, patting you paternally on the shoulder. You will need it. You ride with the Guard at dawn. Am I not going to use the sky ship? Because that would make sense. Maybe it's not a good idea since they shot down the other sky ship. They've got like surface to air missiles, anti sky ship weaponry. As the sun rises above the waters of the home gulf, it sheds its golden light upon the hopeful citizens of Holmgard who have gathered to cheer your departure. You ride out of the King's Citadel at the head of the Guard Cavalry Regiment, with Captain Duvall at your side. Bouquets of some lending roses are thrown before the hooves of your warhorse, and your ears ring to the jubilant cries of the crowd, as you and the brave horsemen at your back ride with pride through the city streets that lead to Holmgard's North Gate. Once outside the city, you order your troop to couch their lances and form up in column, four abreast, in readiness for a swift ride north. At midday, you cross the river Unorum and meet with a patrol of border rangers who are guarding a junction. A track emerges from the Fryland Forest and joins with the main road from the west at this point. Although it is unsigned, you recognize its rutted surface at once. It is the Alima Trail one of several forest tracks which lead to the Kai Monastery, 30 miles distant. Captain Duvall tells you that the enemy line is weakest at a place several miles along this trail. The border rangers come quickly to attention when they see you approaching. Their leader, a sergeant with a battle-wounded leg, warns you that the enemy were seen earlier flying over this area of the forest. You acknowledge his salute, and then you give the order for the regiment to form up in column, two abreast, before leading them along the trail and into the Fryland Forest. You have covered less than a mile of this woodland track when you find yourself descending a gentle slope towards a stream, a tributary of the Unorum. There once was a bridge which crossed the watercourse at this point, but it has long since collapsed. Its ancient stones now form a ford which carries the trail over to the far side of the stream. I do have Grand Hunt Mastery and I'm higher than a Sun Lord. Your Kai Mastery alerts you to a beam of ultraviolet light at the exit from the ford. This pencil thin beam eliminates. eliminates? This pencil thin beam emanates from behind the age worn keystone of the old bridge crosses the exit just inches off the ground and disappears into some bushes opposite. Call him halt! You shout, bringing the regiment to a stop at the approach to the ford. Is something wrong, Grandmaster? Asked Duvall anxiously. Perhaps, you reply, staring at the beam which is invisible to the captain's eyes. Wait here, Captain, while I satisfy my curiosity. You urge your horse forward and approach the fallen keystone. As you draw closer, you sense that it conceals an explosive device constructed from materials not of this world. 
It is an elaborate booby trap planted here by Nars minions, and it is set to detonate should any large creature unwittingly break the beam. I think I'll use Grand Nexus to disarm this. You tell Captain Duvall to take the regiment 50 yards back along the trail. When he has complied with your order, you move upstream until you can see, at an angle, the source of the ultraviolet beam. It is a shiny metallic polyhedron, studded with rivets. Using your Kai Mastery of Nexus, you cause the device to rise. You have lifted it no more than a few inches when suddenly it is torn apart by a violent explosion that peppers the area around the ford with sharp splinters of rock. As the dust of the explosion clears, you signal to Duvall to bring the regiment forward. Lancashire, you're with us, says the captain as he leads the men across the ford. Without you, this wicked sorcery would have cost us dear. Yeah, it would have. After the explosion at the ford, you sense that the regiment is more wary of the surrounding forest. You proceed at a slower, more cautious pace, and keep a watchful eye on the trail ahead. You have not gone very far when your eagle eyes detect something amiss in the undergrowth away to your right. You magnify your vision and see a patch of gray among the greens of the forest floor. After a few moments, you recognize it to be the sole of a man's boot. What is the soul of a man? It's boot. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna halt the troop and examine. You signal to Captain Duvall to bring the regiment to a halt. Then, as soon as they are stationary, you dismount and move into the undergrowth alone. Stealthily, you advance towards the boot, suspecting it to be another of the enemy's booby traps. But when you get to within a few feet, you see that it is no trap. A knot tightens in the pit of your stomach and a tear wells up in your eyes. You look with pity at what lies here. Oh no. Tell me it's not like dead Bainden. You have found the body of a Kai master. His torn and crushed remains are clothed in the gray cloak and tunic that denotes his rank within the new order. He has been dead for two or three days. At first, you can hardly bear to look at his face, but when you do, you recognize him at once. It is Swiftfire. He was the fastest runner of all the Kai, and you suspect he may have volunteered to use his speed to try to break through the enemy lines. Sadly, it seems, he could not outrun his fate. Respectfully, you cover his face with his cloak, and say a short prayer to the god Kai to watch over his spirit. Then you return to the regiment, and continue the ride along the trail. Oh, we found our first dead Kai. Bummer. Two miles further along the Alema Trail, you catch your first glimpse of Nars minions. You see five horny-skinned creatures hovering on the breeze 30 feet above the distant tree line. These creatures have wings and tails that shimmer like burnished gold, and armor-like plates which protect their limbs and bellies. From their beaks protrude snaky tongues, and their claw-like hands and feet are tipped with talons that glint like sharpened knives in the sunlight. I have visited Ixia and Lake Vornderal. These here... are lavas. You recognize these creatures at once. They are lavas. Winged horrors from the Plain of Darkness, the domain of the Dark God himself. The memory of your previous experience with these creatures sends a shiver coursing down your spine. With a silent signal, you bring the regiment to a halt. Captain Duvall leans towards you from his saddle and whispers, He is the enemy who have your monastery surrounded, Grandmaster, and this is the weakest point in their line. I know this place, you reply quietly. The monastery lies over the next ridge of trees. If we are to break through here, we must be quick about it. These creatures can take to the skies. It would not take them long to summon reinforcements. You're right, Grandmaster. The risks are indeed great, but I and my men are willing to take them to ensure your return to the Monastery of the Kai. You must get through. 
You are the only one who can destroy the Shadow Gate and remove this curse from our land. Very well then, Captain. You reply, unsheathing your weapon. Pass the order to prepare to charge. How the fuck do a bunch of dudes on horses charge a bunch of flying creatures that are in the air? How does that work? You lead the regiment along the trail to where the surrounding forest opens out into a shallow meadow. Along the center of this grassy clearing there meanders a small stream where a dozen of the winged creatures are spread unevenly along the muddy banks. They, they are staring intently at the water, seemingly fascinated by the sight of the trout swimming there, and at first they do not see the regiment approaching. You give the signal to change formation, to form into two lines abreast for the charge. Then you glance at the wooded rise on the far side of the meadow, knowing that beyond this ridge lies your goal, the Kai Monastery. Suddenly, one of the creatures hovering over the stream raises the alarm and his ghastly brothers ha growl with surprise. Unnervingly, they clack their beaked jaws as they survey the king's cavalry as if they are relishing the thought of an imminent feast. You order the men to lower their lances, and then, with a smile of grim determination on your lips, you spur your horse forward and give voice to your battle cry. For Summerland and the Kai! The King's Cavalry sweep down the meadow and engulf the winged horrors, driving their lances through their steely hides. You see two of the creatures disappear beneath a thundering wave of hooves, and another two are caught from behind as they attempt to take to the air. You strike one creature a blow to its head as you gallop across the stream. It glances off its iron-hard skull, but the force is sufficient to stun the beast. As it staggers drunkenly in your wake, Captain Duvall, who is leading the second line, veers towards it and runs it through with his lance. Once you are over the stream, you spur your horse up the grassy rise towards the top of the ridge, now no more than a hundred yards distant. You are within seconds of reaching the crest of the ridge when suddenly one of the creatures comes swooping out of the sky. It fixes you with its glowing eyes and extends its talons as it comes screaming down towards your face. This is what it looks like. Screaming down towards your face. Alright. Typical lavas. Well, I've killed lavas before. I ain't concerned. I don't have Kai Alchemy or Magi Magic. So, let's just do this. Can I just use the sword? You raise your weapon and brace yourself in the stirrups as the winged horror comes swooping down to rake you with its sword-sharp claws. A 45 combat skill for one creature. Man, Lavas weren't this good before. This creature is attempting to claw you as it swoops past, therefore fight this combat for one round only. Alright. Not immune to Mind Blast, so we're lowering him down to a 41. Let's see who loses more endurance. 60 versus 45, it's gonna be him. Oh, he loses a ton and I lose none. He's down to 27. In this single round of combat, you lose more endurance. If the enemy loses more endurance points, turn to 226. Down to 27. Your hurried blow rips a jagged hole in the wing of the beast. And, suddenly off-balanced by the wound, it loses control and slams into the ground with a sickening crunch. You give a cry of elation, and then you hear Captain Duvall's strident tone rising above the din of the battle. Ride on, Lone Wolf! He shouts. Ride to the monastery! You glance over your shoulder and see the captain and his men locked in combat with the winged creatures. More are swooping in from the east now, drawn by the cries of their brothers. The tide of the battle is turning against Duvall's men, and your heart goes out to them as they struggle bravely against increasing odds. Your instinct is to turn back, but you heed the captain's plea and urge your horse on towards the top of the ridge. The best way you can serve these courageous men now is to reach the Kai Monastery and destroy the Shadow Gate. Alright, so we're moving on. And, uh... Captain Duvall and his men are probably toast. Let's destroy this fucking shadow gate already. You crest the ridge and your spirits soar when you see the Kai Monastery two miles distant. 
The checkered battle banner of the Kai flutters atop the Tower of the Sun, proudly defiant in the face of the hordes of winged lavas circling overhead. The monastery is largely intact, though much of its surrounding wall has been damaged and plumes of smoke rise from the inner keep and training park. Yet, even at this distance, you sense that it is still being held secure from Nar's loathsome minions. You see, here's the monastery. That's pretty cool looking. It's very fortified. The outer wall's kind of fucked up badly. The inner wall looks pretty good. There's some smoke. There's the big tower of the sun. All the lava's flying in the sky and stuff. Yeah. The New Order have indeed proved themselves worthy in your absence. However, the pride you feel for your young acolytes is tempered by the price that has been paid. At the base of the Tower of the Sun, you can see the blackened wreckage of the Sky Rider, Bainden's skyship, twisted and gutted where it fell to the earth. There are bodies strewn about it, but at this distance, even with your magnified vision, you cannot tell if they are friend or foe. Dusk is already upon the land, and darkness will be total within the hour. Mindful of the circling lavas who command the skies, you decide to abandon your horse and continue from here on foot. It will be harder for the enemy to spot you moving through the forest on foot than if you were to continue on horseback. I do have Kai screen and I'm Kai Grand Guardian or higher. So let's do this. You resolve to reach a clearing in the Fryland Forest, a mile to the east of the monastery, where a secret entrance and passageway are located. The passage leads directly to your vault beneath the Tower of the Sun, and it is, it is your intention to gain entry to the monastery by this way. Before you set off towards the woods, you use your psychic mind blend ability as an extra camouflage precaution. Quickly it proves to be wise, for no sooner have you begun to run for the trees than a flight of winged lavas comes soaring out of the clouds overhead. You throw yourself to the ground and they pass by without slowing. Once they have disappeared beyond the ridge, you get to your feet and continue your run for the trees. You rush into the forest and glance overhead to make doubly sure that you are not being tracked by the winged lavas. The darkening sky is clear of the enemy, and confidently you press on through the trees, sure in your ability to remain undetected now that you are in your natural environment of the forest. Soon you reach the clearing, and hurry to a boulder which bears the imprint of a human hand. You place your right hand upon it, and the imprint fits around it like a glove. Silently, a hinged stone slab rises up from the ground, revealing a stair that leads down into a brick-lined passageway. You enter and hurry along this familiar tunnel, covering a mile before you come to a door that opens automatically at your approach. Beyond lies the Vault of the Sun, your personal stronghold. It radiates a warm golden light. It is the rays of the lore stones of Nixator. Once safely inside your underground lair, you pause to allow the radiant light of the lore stones to wash over your tired and aching limbs, and within the space of a few heartbeats, the fatigue of your long journey home is melted away. Restore all lost endurance points. I don't need it. I'm not uh, down any endurance, but that's nice. It's nice to get the full heal. Revived and revitalized. You throw open the door to the vault and see a young Kai master standing guard at the foot of the tower stairwell. He is Saber Fox, one of your most gifted students. G -g Grand Master, he stammers, hardly daring to believe his eyes. Y You've returned! Praise the gods! Our prayers have been answered! You smile at the young Kai master, who now has tears of joy in his steel gray eyes. Yes, Saber Fox, you reply, I have returned. Now let us vanquish this foe and rid our land of their evil shadow. With Saber Fox at your side, you climb the circular stairs to the Grand Hall of the Tower of the Sun. Excitedly, the young Kai Master announces your arrival to the battle-weary Kai who are gathered here. And at first, they look at you in stunned disbelief. Then the truth of what they see sinks in, and they give vent to a loud cheer that can be heard all throughout the monastery. 
The news of your return spreads like wildfire. Two of the first to welcome you back are your friend, Guildmaster Bainden, and your trusted advisor, Lord Ramoa. Oh, yay, they're alive! Yay! Thank you, Sheer, you're alive, Bainden, you say, clasping his hand in friendship. In Homeguard, they, they fear that you and Ramoa were killed aboard your skyship. It gladdens my heart to see this is not so. And it warms me to see you safely home, Grandmaster, he replies. Though we've been hard-pressed to keep your home safe in the absence, in your absence, adds Lord Ramoa with a wry smile. You both have my deepest thanks, you reply. You took a great risk in coming to the aid of the Kai. I have seen what became of your skyship, Bainden. You were indeed fortunate to have survived. Aye, he replies sadly. Yet, alas, three of my brotherhood were not so blessed. They perished when the lava dragged us from the skies. Take heart, Bainden, for their deaths will not be in vain. They shall be avenged. And with these prophetic words, you take the sun crystal from your pocket and show it to your grieving friend. With this crystal, I shall destroy the Shadow Gate and put an end to Nar's evil plan. Together with Bainden and Ramoa, you make a tour of the monastery to assess for yourself the extent of the battle damage. Your presence among the young Kai greatly improves their morale and strengthens their resolve to withstand the Lavas' siege. You visit every area of the monastery, including the lower hall of Solaris, where the bodies of those slain in battle have been laid out, awaiting burial. It saddens you to see so many Kai dead, and, as you walk among their still ranks, you recognize many in whom you held high hopes. Spring Rain, East Wind, Sharp Dove, Deep Heart, Frost Lark, and Firefly. I had high hopes in Firefly, but it was cancelled before its time. As you learn to leave the lore hall, as you turn to leave the lore hall, your vow to Bainden and Ramoa that the sacrifice they have made will never be forgotten. You return to the Grand Hall where Bainden and Ramoa tell you of the location of the Shadow Gate. Kai scouts sighted it in the foothills of the Durncrag Mountains, less than five miles distant, at a place called Raven's Eyrie, says Bainden. I know this place, you say. My old tutor, Stormhawk, and I camped there on a hunting trip when I was an acolyte, before the war with Dark Lord Zagarna. There is a track that leads there. I know it well. You are determined to destroy the Shadow Gate, and you resolve to go to Raven's Eyrie tonight to carry out the mission. Also, you are aware that tomorrow is a very special day. It is Fomarn, the first day of spring. Oh, that's the day where the, all the Kai were massacred the first time. A holy day in Summerland, when traditionally all of the Kai gather at the monastery to reaffirm their fealty to King Olnar and the god Kai. It is also the anniversary of the massacre of the First Order the day upon which all of your warrior cast, save you, were massacred by Dark Lord Zagarna's hordes. I will destroy the Shadowgate tonight, you vow resolutely, and tomorrow we shall celebrate Famarn, secure in the knowledge that a lasting peace is returned to our land. Moments later, a doleful bell sounds from atop the Durncrag Tower. It is the alarm. Hurry, my lords! shouts a young Kai savant who comes rushing breathlessly into the ground hall. The enemy are attacking in force! To your battle positions, my lords! you command as you stride towards the door. The time has come for you to avenge your dead brothers! Fight well! Fight true! The spirit of the sun god Kai is with us this night! A, break, a great cloud of winged lavas is speeding towards the monastery from the northwest, and they will arrive within a few minutes at most. As you watch the young Kai lords arm themselves and take up their positions around the monastery, you consider where best to position yourself for the imminent battle. Do I want to join the acolytes who are lining the battlements of the North Watch? Or do I want to fight from the top of the Tower of the Sun, the highest point in the Kai Monastery? I'm thinking Tower of the Sun. Tower of the Sun, feeling that.
From the top of the Tower of the Sun, you survey the mountainous northern approaches with growing trepidation. Bainden is by your side. So too are Kai Masters Black Hawk and Wild Weasel, and a score of Kai Warmorns and Savants. You sense the lower ranks of the Kai are proud and excited to be stationed here with their Grand Master. Your presence inspires their courage, and you feel confident that they will fight exceptionally well in the coming battle. You look down at the shattered wreck of the Skyrider lying in the monastery grounds far below, and it reminds you of your sky journey from Cassiorn to Holmgard. You tell Bainden about the Cloud Dancer, and you promise him that, if your mission to destroy the Shadowgate is successful, you will make a gift of it to him, in recognition of the help he has given the Kai in your absence. Damn it! So we get a sky ship, and now it's lost already. Thank you, Grandmaster, he says. Yours is a most gracious gesture. Then the first of the Lava's Horde are seen, their burnished wings glinting in the moonlight. Here they come! shouts Black Hawk from the far end of the tower. Take up your bows, my lords! you cry as the first wave of these winged beasts comes sweeping down from out of the northern sky. And make every arrow count! Here's the deal. No, I don't have a bow because I sold it, but it makes sense to me that I just came back to the monastery where I own everything, and I've been hanging around here and walking around. I mean, surely there's an extra bow that I could have grabbed. You know what I'm saying? But no, I guess I didn't think of that. I was too excited about everything. I didn't think to grab a bow, so no, I don't have a bow. You shout the order to fire, and the Kai let loose their straining bowstrings. A cloud of arrows with armor-piercing tips, hardened in the fires of the monastery forge, whistles towards the swooping lavas with impressive accuracy. All find their target, but only one of the winged creatures falls from the sky. You see that the beast has been struck in the eye. Hurriedly, the acolytes reload as the lavas prepare to land on the Tower of the Sun. Fire at their eyes, you shout! Go for the eyes, boo! Go for the eyes! And a cloud of Kai arrows is sent screaming through the sky to seek their elusive mark. This time, more than half find their target, decimating the onrushing lavas at a single stroke. Yet those winged creatures who do survive this deadly volley are quickly among the defenders on the tower. Suddenly you are confronted by one of these beasts who attempts to strike you from the tower with its horny tail. You leap to avoid its scything attack, draw your weapon in mid-air, and swing your first blow the moment your feet return to the, the the moment your feet return to the flagstones. All right, so this one's pretty tough. Forty-nine combat skill. I might use. Uh, my full-on Kai Surge here. So the way that works is I'm going to reduce his thing by 8. I have to take a point of damage every round I do it. Actually, looks like I can use the automatic thing this time. Kai Surge. Let's do this. 60 and 45. So all I lost was the one from Kai Surge, and he lost a bunch. All I lost was the damage from Kai Surge. I'm glad I used that, because it made the difference high enough that I was able to really kick his ass. Kai Surge coming in handy. Using it. Loving it. Healing up. The defenders on the tower fight like lions. The battle is fierce and bloody throughout the monastery, but the struggle is soon won and the shaken remnants of the winged attackers are repelled with heavy losses. A great cheer goes up as the last of the battered lavas limps into the air and makes its escape towards the Dern Crags. Illustration, lavas getting stabbed with a spear. You leave the tower and tour the battlements, offering words of comfort to the wounded and praising those Kai who have shown exceptional bravery. You are returning to the Grand Hall when you see Bainden approaching from the other direction. The time is right for you to begin your mission, Grand Master, he says. The enemy have lost a great number this night. It is unlikely they will return before the dawn. Yes, my friend, you reply, touching the pocket of your tunic which contains the sun crystal. You're right. 
A time has come. I will leave for Raven's Eyrie at once. Here we go to some Raven's Eyrie. You leave the monastery under cover of darkness and set off towards the northwest, into the foothills, the Durncrag Mountains. Soon you pick up the trail that leads to Raven's Eyrie, and you follow it for a mile to where it crosses a mountain stream. Mist oozes from the peaty soil, breathing a damp film on the surrounding rocks. You continue beyond the mist-enshrouded stream until you reach a rocky spur of granite called Eagle's Claw. Here you detect a low humming sound and your pulse quickens. You sense you are getting closer to the shadow gate. This resonant hum steadily increases in volume the nearer you get to Raven's Eyrie. Then, as you come to within a few hundred yards of the peak, you catch your first glimpse of the shadow gate. It is an awe-inspiring sight. There is the shadow gate. Wow, it looks its like radiating black tendrils of shadowy light or something. It appears like a black semicircular cave mouth that seems to hover motionless in the air. Crackling snakes of electrical energy surround its edges, and the air before it rises and shimmers like a desert mirage. You reach into the pocket of your tunic and remove the sun crystal, weighing it carefully in your hand so that you will be ready to throw it accurately when the time comes. Yeah, it would suck to miss. Throw the sun crystal at it and like miss and it shatters on the rocks and you're just like, oh god, dun 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 dun. That'd be some serious, that'd be some serious prices right losing horn. The electrical fire that borders the shadow gate suddenly flares and gives off hissing sparks which climb like fireworks into the night sky. Moments later, a trio of lavas emerge from its total darkness and soar into the air. Judging by their direction of flight, you determine that they are going to reinforce the enemy line which keeps King Ulnar's armies at bay. You are too far from the Shadow Gate to hurl the Sun Crystal, and so, with caution, you begin to inch your way nearer to your goal. I do have both Grand Passmanship and Telenosis. Your Kai Mastery warns you that another flight of Lavas are about to emerge from the Shadow Gate. You flatten yourself against the damp granite rocks and wait until this second flight passes overhead before resuming your steady advance up the mountainside towards the shadow gate, now less than a hundred yards distant. When you have climbed to within thirty yards, you draw back your arm and get ready to hurl the sun crystal into the inky black core. Man, throwing something with accuracy thirty yards, what am I, a fucking NFL quarterback? Of course, he's a lone wolf. He's, like, super awesome at everything, basically. At this moment, a piercing shriek rises above the throbbing hum of the Shadow Gate, and, to your horror, you look up to see a lavas diving towards your chest. Hurriedly, you throw the Sun Crystal before the creature can press home its attack. Oh, good. I'm glad we threw the Sun Crystal in a hurry. If you roll- If I fucking miss. If I fucking miss. Oh, my God. All right, here we go. Random number time. I got a six. That's probably good. That's probably good. The Lavas veers away from you and uses its wings to deflect the sun crystal. With dismay, you watch as the glowing crystal drops harmlessly among the rocks. I missed! I missed! <laughs> son of a bitch. At least it didn't break. Below the entrance to the Shadow Gate. Hurriedly, you scramble over the jagged granite in a desperate attempt to retrieve the sun crystal. But in doing so, you lose your footing and fall heavily among the rocks. Lose three endurance points. The shrieking lava snatches you off the mountainside and soars into the air. At first, you struggle to free yourself from its mighty claws, but then you see the creature is carrying you directly towards the yawning black maw of the shadow gate, and you freeze with shock. Moments before entering this hellish abyss, you look down and get a passing glimpse of the sun crystal lying among the rocks, no more than 30 feet from the entrance to the Shadow Gate. I do have Grand Nexus and Grand Thane. Does that mean I'm about to explode the sun crystal with my mind and cause it to somehow eliminate the Shadow Gate in that way?
The instant you pass through the Shadow Gate, you are assailed by howling gales and winds. Yet, despite the freezing coldness of this abyss, you feel no pain. Your body is protected, cocooned and shielded by your advanced mastery of the discipline of Nexus. Oh, that's right, this is the thing where you can go through the Shadow Gates and it won't hurt you. You feel as if both you and the Lavas are whirling downwards in ever-decreasing circles into the core of a vortex, and rapidly you lose all track of time. Then, as abruptly as it began, the whirling ceases, and the frigidity of the abyss is transformed into a harsh and blistering heat. Shielded as you are, this extreme temperature feels pleasantly warm. Nevertheless, with fearful apprehension, you force open your eyes to look upon the nightmare realm that now surrounds you. So we've just gone through a shadow gate again. What is this, the fourth time? Going through a sh maybe, maybe it's only the third time. It's the third or fourth time we've gone through a shadow gate into another realm. Starting to become old hat at this point, honestly. Talisman of Ashir is a special item. Oh, I do have that then, because I had a Talisman of Ashir and I marked it off as a backpack item. But if it's a special item, then sh yeah, I have it. With dread, you cast your eyes across a nightmare landscape that stretches in every direction to a horizon dancing with fire. Streams of blazing lava cut fissures through the coal black soil, and pools of molten mud, glowing cherry red, spout geysers of yellow flame that seem to claw vengefully at the orange sky. The heat and the stench of sulfur is overwhelming. The lava drops you onto the shifting black soil and soars upwards until it disappears into the roiling clouds. In the middle distance, you see a herd of dragon-like creatures snorting fire as they lumber slowly across this hellish plain. You sense great danger, and when you focus your Kai skills at the approaching leviathans, you are shocked by what you learn. You have been transported to the Plain of Darkness, the domain occupied and ruled over by Nar, the Dark God. The approaching dragon creatures are massing to enter the Shadow Gate that lies several hundred yards at your back. They are Nar's newest creations, and you sense that if they are allowed entry to your world, Somerland and the Kai are doomed. So I possess all of these things. I'm not sure which one I should use. Let's use the Platinum Amulet since I've had that for the longest. You give thanks for the Platinum Amulet, for you sense that it is protecting your body from the extreme heat and toxic atmosphere of this hellish plain. However, the amulet alone is not sufficient to keep you safe from the creatures that are now advancing rapidly towards the Shadow Gate. Full heal. Oh shit. The herd of coppery red dragons continues its relentless advance across the fiery plain. You count more than a hundred in total, and each one is as long and as broad as a galleon. The largest of their number, who is also the swiftest of foot, comes looming towards you, breathing blasts of blue flame. His scaly brethren halt in their tracks and watch expectantly, through hooded black eyes, as their leader stalks you like a cat preying upon a helpless dormouse. So that is a pretty serious illustration. Of these huge, scary, wingless dragons. High above, swooping in and out of the clouds, are scores of cackling lavas. You sense also another presence, a wispy dark shadow that exudes malevolence. You shudder when you realize that you are in the presence of a manifestation of Nar himself. He has come to witness your doom, to enjoy the sport of your final futile battle before he unleashes his dragons upon Somerland. The Lavas' attacks were but a preliminary phase of his master plan to destroy Somerland and the Kai. With terror in your heart, you retreat across the moving sands in a desperate attempt to reach the Shadow Gate, your only hope of escape. The dragon continues to advance, and it utters a thunderous roar as it bares its fangs in preparation for its attack. I do not have a bow currently. 
I sold my bow. From the depths of its cavernous gullet, the dragon coughs forth a concentrated jet of white-hot flame that comes speeding towards your chest. Wide-eyed with fear, you leap aside desperately to avoid being incinerated by this lance of dragon fire. I do not possess Kai Alchemy, sadly. You, fear the, you feel the searing heat of the dragon's breath blister your legs as you dive headlong to avoid its deadly jet of flame. Pick a random number. Endurance 12 or less, deduct 1. Current endurance 13 or add 1. So I get to add 1. This right here is an instant death. So if I roll a 0 or a 1, instant death. But I'm not going to. Alright, I got a 4 this time. Yay. 3 or higher. Your quick reactions have saved you from being burnt alive, but this feat does not impress the dragon. Your escape from his incinerating breath serves to make him even angrier. In a fit of pique, he stomps his massive forefoot down onto the black soil and sends a splash of molten mud and flame soaring into the sulfurous sky. You use this opportunity to retreat towards the Shadow Gate, but you do not get very far before the great beast sees you and comes lumbering forwards with his jaw agape. Unless you have a platinum amulet, a talisman or a, of a shear, or the discipline of Grand Nexus. You must deduct three endurance due to the debilitating effects of the heat and atmosphere. I have all three of those things, so I ain't deducting shit. You raise your weapon before your face, dig your heels into the shifting soil, and pray to the goddess Ashir to watch over you as the dragon gets ready to lash out with fang and claw. And I do possess the Summer Sword, so we're about to have a tough-ass fight, I think. Oh, damn. As if in answer to your prayer, to the goddess Ashir, the blade of your divine sword suddenly radiates a blinding halo of golden light. You sense that you hold in your hands a weapon capable of destroying the dragon, and this realization greatly lifts your spirits. Restore any endurance points lost so far. That's cool. Nice full heal there, too. Didn't need it, but awesome anyway. The dragon growls with disdain as the light of your sword washes over his scaly hide. He raises a claw-tipped forepaw and lashes out in an attempt to swat the Samra sword from your grasp, but you duck the blow and thrust the blade into his side. He roars with pain, but then he leaps at you with frightening speed. So we now have to fight Vaxagor, who has 56 combat skill, which is a lot. I have more endurance than him, though. Finally, we get to fight a dragon, 18 books in. Of course, you knew we were going to fight a dragon when the name of the book is Dawn of the Dragons. This creature is immune to all forms of psychic attack except Kai Surge and Kai Blast. Nice, so I can Kai Surge him. Due to the increased power of your sword while upon the Plane of Darkness, you may add 4 to your combat skill for the duration of this fight. That is great. That is so great. I'm about to wreck this guy then because check it out. First of all, I get to turn on Kai Surge, giving me 58 combat skill, which is better than him. Then the plus four I'm going to take off of his, giving him only 52. So I have a nice advantage over him. This should be easy, actually. 60 and 52, round one. I lost three, one from Kai Surge, two from him. He lost eight. 57, 43, go. I lost four. He lost eight. I'm, we're doing this. We're doing this. 53-35. Go round three. I only lost one. He lost, what, 14? Nice. That was just one from Kai Surge. 52 and 21. Go. I lost three. He lost 10. 49 and 11. I lost four. He lost eight. And we should finish it right here. We should finish it right here. 45 and 3. I lost three and he's dead! We just fought a crazy ass shadow plane dragon and handled business. Kai Surge was really helpful there. Really helpful. Glad I took Kai Surge. It was really good in this book. Victory is ours. Start healing in case I need to get in another fight. The death of Vaxagor stuns the dragon herd into frozen silence, and you seize this opportunity to make a dash for the Shadow Gate. Before Nar can direct his lavas to block your escape, 
You reach the shadow gate and hurl yourself through into the whirling black abyss. Oh, and that Grand Nexus Grand Thane coming in handy again. The howling winds of the abyss buffet you unmercifully as you spin around this whirling black vortex. Pressure begins to build in your body, and soon the pain in your head and chest become almost unbearable. It feels as if you are being torn apart. But then Grand Nexus protects me. You draw upon your Kai Mastery for protection, and gradually you feel the pain subside. Flashing motes of light are beginning to whirl past you in the inky blackness, and faint sounds are reaching your ears, emanating from a pinpoint of light in the far distance. This speck of light steadily grows until it seems to fill your senses, and with an abruptness that leaves you gasping for breath, you suddenly find yourself lying face down on a slab of damp granite. Oh, I missed, I missed normal world, world, earth and stone. I will never take it for granite again. Yeah, yeah, Let's let that one sink in. Still shaking from the effects of your return through the shadow gate, you slowly get to your feet and look out across the surrounding foot, foothills. Here on your home world, several hours have passed since you were carried through the Shadow Gate and into the Plain of Darkness, and as you survey the land, you notice that the first rays of the Famarn Dawn are beginning to color the eastern horizon. You look down at the mountainous slopes which descend before the yawning black mouth of the Shadow Gate, and to your relief, you see the faint golden shimmer of the Sun Crystal. It is still lying where it fell, thirty feet below where you are now standing. I don't have Kai Alchemy. I have Mind Over Matter, though. I should just telekinesis that shit up here. I don't have Kai Alchemy. Quickly, you make your descent across the rocks to where the Sun Crystal lies, but in your hurry, you slip and fall on the wet granite. Pick a number from the random number table. If Grand Hunt Mastery add 3, Grand Nexus add 2, Grand Pathmanship add 1. So I get to add 6. I don't even have to roll. I can't fail, even if I rolled a 0. That must have been an instant death fall down the mountain right there. I just won the book. You do not slip very far before you are able to arrest your fall and ascend at a slower pace. Descend, descend at a slower pace. You find the sun crystal lying wedged among the rocks, and with a growing sense of awe, you take hold of it and weigh it in your hand. Then you turn to look back at the shadow gate in order to gauge your throw. The halo of energy which surrounds the shadow gate begins to crackle fiercely, and your Kai instincts tingle with a strange and sinister premonition. You can sense that on the plane of darkness, Nar has just consigned his newest champions to the shadow gate through which you escaped. His mighty dragon herd is on its way to Magnamund. As the first rays of the dawn sun spread across the surrounding rocks, you draw back your arm and hurl the sun crystal into the gaping maw of the shadow gate. Turn to 350. That's victory. 350 is the final section. There is a blinding flash as the sun crystal passes through the shadow gate, and a deafening implosion follows which sucks a whirlwind of air and loose rock into its whirling core. For a few moments you hear a terrible far-off scream. It is the lonely cry of Nar himself, lamenting the destruction of his dragon herd, which, by your action, you have consigned to oblivion. The vortex continues to whirl, but it is growing smaller as its collapsing power fades. It shrinks and shrinks until, with a final crack, it disappears completely. You return to the monastery, where, upon your arrival at the north gate, you are treated to the loud and joyous applause of the young Kai warriors. Bainden and Ramoa praise and congratulate you for your victory over the minions of Nar. It is a victory that will long be remembered in the history of Sauerland and the legends of the Kai. Congratulations, Grand Master Lone Wolf. Once again, you have triumphed over the evil forces of the Dark God. You are truly a brave and exceptional warrior. Yet the fight against evil has still to be won. A new and chilling manifestation of this evil will soon appear in your world, and it is an evil that will test your skills to the limit. The nature of this challenge awaits you in the next Grand Master Adventure, which is entitled Wolf's Bane. Dun dun dun! 
And that is it. We made it through another book. Almost five hours. Almost five hours. We made it. We made it through another one. We were victorious. We only died one time, and that was due to a sad random... That was rolling a fucking zero and getting killed. Otherwise, we'd have made it through without dying. Kai Surge was awesome. I'm glad I took it. It was really handy. We got to spend lots of money, lose lots of money, heal lots of people in this book. I even I even lost my bow and my I even sold my bow. I lost all my shit. I'm gonna need to tap that uh, savings at the monastery in the start of the next book. But yeah, good to go. That's going to bring us to the end of book 18, Dawn of the Dragons, complete. Fun times, fun times. This was, a, this was a pretty cool book. We traveled a very long distance in this book. We got a skyship. We gave the skyship away already. We went through like eight different horses. All right, good times. Well, see you next time for Wolf's Bane, book 19. Until then, that is going to do it. So thank you for watching. This has been Josiah Plays, Lone Wolf, book 18, Dawn of the Dragons.